You're listening to Find the Good News, Episode 20, The Umbrella Spoke, featuring Tom Trahan. This episode of Find the Good News is sponsored by Parker Brand Creative Services, a branding agency that thinks sideways, pushes forward, and gets your brand up. Check out our work at parkerbrandup.com. Would you like to help make sure I'm asking my guests the really good questions? Just visit findthegood.news and click the questions tab. I'll see if I can get your question dropped in the fishbowl. Each episode, my guests will dive deep, select three random questions, and if yours is selected, I'll ask it on the show. That's findthegood.news. What happens when the right person is placed in the right position to do the right job at the right time in history? For me, there's no guesswork involved in answering that question. I don't have to wonder about it. I only have to look right here in my hometown of Sulphur, Louisiana to see what that looks like, to see history unfolding. In fact, I only have to look a few minutes down the road to a little office at the Brimstone Museum to find the good news. That's where my dear friend Tom Trahan has been passionately creating and curating for over a decade. There is an enthusiasm, cheer, and general feeling of happiness around Tom. Those were the first things I noticed when I met him at the Henning Cultural Center almost 10 years ago. As the executive director of the Brimstone Historical Society, Tom has eagerly worked with local volunteers to see the Cultural Center and Brimstone Museum grow from a couple of historic buildings to a complex that offers annual art galleries, workshops, cultural events, and festivals, as well as permanent historic displays. Tom is as humble a man as you will meet, and he is quick to shy away from personal accolades. I feel that it is very important to him that any accomplishment in our community be seen as a group effort, because he knows that the spirit of togetherness is how change takes root in a place and becomes lasting. Tom has a long view of history, and he knows that everything he accomplishes today is one link in a chain of events. He understands that we each have to take our little place in history. That's why he finds great value in just being kind and leaving his little corner of the world better than he found it. He's found his place in history, and I think that's how history will remember him. I'm happy to know Tom, and I feel honored to call him my good friend. Wake up, it's morning. You're dreaming up a story I can hear. The way it's going, cause you're laughing in your sleep on the path to you. Deliverance and a holy wall of light pouring through your window. Old news, bad I'm news, happy. fake news. Sometimes Help you just want to shut it all I down and get no news at all. With Find the Good News, I aim to change that by focusing on good people doing good work. I visit with artists, educators, civic and spiritual leaders, musicians, business owners, students, volunteers, and everyday citizens who are using their creativity, resources, and talents to bring hope and happiness to their corner of the world. In each episode, I dig into the hearts and minds of my extraordinary guests. We have street-level conversations about relatable things going on in their lives, discover the critical life experiences that shape them, the perspectives that drive them, and the fundamental beliefs that are anchoring them to a path of goodness. There's a lot of news in the world. My name is Orrin Parker, and I'm going to find the good. And I love you just. So far, we haven't. Politics hasn't come up, That's and awesome. I, I think it's good. Mm-hmm. Not that I don't think you shouldn't talk about politics, but it just seems like um, it's a hot button. It's hot button, and I don't know. I'll say this: I don't know that I've had any really mature conversations about it. I believe that you can't change anybody's mind anymore. Just no, no. And even on that, you, you. Uh, you reach a point where, it, at least at the national level, there's not really any change, and the on the individual level, like I can't affect a national anything. Oh right. Um, that's that's unfortunate, but you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I guess every now every every opinion can be heard on social media too. Yeah. I don't know. It's a beehive out there. And I believe honestly, on both sides of everything, there's 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 good intentions or whatever. There are some people that don't have good intentions but there are a lot that that do they think what they think is right 
and they think that it's better for humanity or whatever and it's just it's dangerous it's not yeah so anyway yeah hard to have have discussions that's partly um why i like this format because mm-hmm. and i was just discussing this with danny elaine he was on recently oh i started teaser today yeah oh did you yeah. okay cool yeah i mean we talked about that this format um we can finish our conversation yeah you know and we it can't we're not really yeah you can manicure it to some degree but you're not uh able to sit there and choose your words as wisely and and nobody can just jump in and dispute what you're saying right, right out the gate and just derail things and take you down the side track right. if we're going to go down any path it's going to be the paths you and i take okay you know yeah, so it's yeah. i like that i like that better that doesn't mean people won't come in after the fact and you know, typical uh, internet troll behavior, but I haven't had any of that thus far. That's so good. So that's good. So yeah, I'm actually glad you're here. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I this mean, this has been fun. Or it's, it's been fun to think about. Uh, I'm I'm crazy nervous. Like if if nervousness is on a scale of like zero to ten, with zero being like in front of a nice cozy you know, fireplace or whatever, reading your favorite book and 10 being like you're in the middle of a house that's on fire. I'm probably at 11. I'm oh, so, wow. I'm really? Joking. Yeah. Wow. I don't do recorded things well. Like I'm always very surprised with the end result. Like, like recently I was on the news a few times for the, um, yeah. the sulfur mines exhibit and stuff. And, uh, it was like see, seeing the end result. Number one, I never want to watch. Like, I don't even want to see the end result. But then I'll get comments from family or whatever, and they'll say, oh, no, you were actually really good. Usually it's my mom who will call and say, you know, <laughs> right. like, hey, you should really watch it. Or she'll show it at her house. Like, I'll be there, and she'll be like, and you're oh, like yeah, I'm going. I'm out yeah. of the room. <laughs> and so, uh, so I'm always very surprised that people can take somebody like me and, like, make it look good (laughs) well i don't know if they're making you look good because i actually would agree with your mom i mean you and i were just the other day talking about that video that uh npr yeah it was uh, lpb lpb okay Mm -hmm. so yeah npr that's radio i don't know what i'm talking about uh yeah so lpb i watched that video and i was like man tom i didn't know if you had like a teleprompter or if you were just talking off the cuff i was like man he really really can speak about what he knows so that's just the confidence of knowing i guess the subject and you know, knowing that not a lot of people in Louisiana can dispute what you're saying because not many people know that that history. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure I got some little minor things wrong, but I've studied it quite a bit. So I kind of yeah. know, you know, I know what it is. Well, you know, I mean, it's like anything. I think we uh, we're all this show is about the people who are doing good in the community, like we talked about. Mm-hmm. And I think what we call do gooder. Or, or someone being a do-gooder, I think that may be, can almost be a derogatory term, but when I look around, I look around and say, hey, there's a lot of people that are doing good. They're not thinking about that they're doing good. They're not labeling themselves a do-gooder. They're just instinctively doing things day to day. And something you said the other day that really stuck with me, because I'm, I'm a pretty avid camper. I love the outdoors. And uh, you said, you know, the, the Boy Scout training or that the 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 rule of leaving a campsite better than you had found it. Right. And that that's uh, your sort of personal motto towards the way you live your life and the way yeah, you, you treat your profession, what you're My whole in. existence. Like, that's what, you know, whenever I pass away, I don't want people to say, like, man, he really wrecked everything he touched. You know, I want I want there to be a lasting result that's positive on the, the community or the city or even just a, on the personal level with my own family that they say, you know, he was a, a really good, you know, guy to know and just to be, you know, kind and uh, sharing and whatever else. All the, all the, talk about having different kinds of morals different people are driven by different motivations for me it's just that that positive influence the the desire to be not not liked necessarily but just at least like thought well of i guess would be a good way to say it like nobody they might not like me but they say well he was all right guy you know yeah that's that's what i shoot for well that's that's a pretty i think that's a good thing to shoot for i mean what more could you ask for than to just leave something behind that's positive or an influence of any kind i mean even with your children or especially your community i mean some of us don't have any influence outside of the doors of our home sure you know i mean and i look at you and i go you you definitely to me again i I can only come come at it from what i've heard and then also what i know but you know, I've grew up in sulfur, mm-hmm. just like you, and uh, I've watched your corner of sulfur, if I can call it that, your little playground over there, hmm. just expand and change and grow. 
and I know there's a lot of different connections and how it's a sure. bunch of, it's collective people that are doing that. But just since the time that I met you, and I don't know if you remember when I met you actually, but uh, I do. I remember. Be- I remember part of it. Um, and just be- real fast before you tell that part, to go back to what you said about you know my you know my little corner of the town or whatever. I feel like a guy who's like on a surfboard on a, jar, a large wave or something and, and like all this energy and community spirit and drive from people before me who started the, the wheels in motion, I feel privileged to be able to ride that wave and be the guy doing the cool surfboard tricks. But the wave is what was happening as I was starting my position. I and see. I, I feel like I contributed in, in, in a lot of ways, like with fundraising and, you know, programming and stuff like that. But but I do feel like none of it was possible without the support of the, the people on my board and the people surrounding our organization, the other partners we've worked with in the past and stuff. Like it's been it's been a really good um a really good positive thing in my opinion, uh, for our community, you know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I guess that's kind of interesting in a position like yours, especially a dedicated position and having a dedicated servant like you, I guess is what I would, the way I should say that when I think of someone like you, I, and and just knowing the private conversations we've had and then the passion that you bring to it, I, I see somebody who it goes, I guess it goes beyond just the paycheck. Do you know? Absolutely. I mean, and I've heard you say that many times, this is way more than just about, uh, you know, what you earn. Right. That's right. Yeah, that, I've been told by you know even people on my own board that I'm crazy for for doing the job that I do for the little bit that I get paid. But I wouldn't do it if I didn't feel um, whatever you call it uh, um, complete. I guess or that's a that's not maybe the best word for it. But I feel like I my motivation is to is to like we said earlier to better the area around me, and I feel like I'm I'm fulfilling that. And so that's the word I was looking for, fulfilled. Yeah. I feel fulfilled in my job and as opposed to the the amount that I make. Um, and so it, in, in, like we, we talked about in a previous conversation, it's not so much the amount of money that you have. It's the it's – the, uh, it's what you do with it, I guess, is a good sure. way to say it. Yeah. Because like we we aren't you know wealthy or well off or anything like that. However, I do feel like we live in excess. Like my family has everything we need, and I know there are families that don't. And so I feel very blessed and fortunate to be in the position that I am, and to have the the amount that I receive in in exchange for the work that I do because I'm able to have enough for my own family and enough to give away as well. So um, that's that's always something that, you know, I saw my parents doing that when I was younger. They were always contributing to, you know, either family members who were um, not as well off or, or coworkers or, you know, they, they noticed needs in their own circles and, and they took care of that. And I, I feel like I feel pretty proud that I uh, am able to do the same, you know, in my circles. Uh, so anyway, that's that's. Yeah, your parents feed into your own life. That's that's one thing I learned from mine. So sure, I mean it's kind of like making gold, you know. Out of uh, what I read, you ever read the book The Alchemist by Paulo uh, Paulo Coelho? I picked that up like a few months ago and never finished it. Like I, I maybe read a page of it because I saw it on some list online. That was yeah, like, you should really read this book and have never really gone further than just a, a page or two into it. I just haven't had time. you know. Well, well, I guess it's kind of what you're talking about, or at least it was one of my takeaways from reading that book is, is the idea of alchemy, you know, making gold from lead. And, and in a way, uh, you know, and, and we sort of live in a world where we, we want change to happen quickly and we want sort of an instant flip. And when we want something, we need it now. But to transmute something like lead into gold takes time. It doesn't happen instantly. And in a way, what you're describing, and I try to do that in my own life too, is all the history of your ancestors, everything that's filtered through over time is sort of like the lead on the other end of that historical spectrum. Sure. And you're doing the alchemy. Each generation is is trying to transmute whatever they got and glean the, the bright parts out and then make those even brighter, hand them off to their children, and hopefully someday we get gold out of that. Sure. You know, and that's and kind don't of... don't turn it back to lead. <laughs> don't right. be the generation don't that ruins yeah. it. Well, and that can happen, too. Yeah. And I guess in a way, that's what I... I'm Jumping back, that's kind of what I think of when I think of you, you know. Um, 
So when I first heard your name, I didn't know you. It was when Jason Barnes was still in, I guess, the director position. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I was working at another advertising agency at the time, and I believe he was he had just left, and our and he we were having a meeting with him about um, his new position. He was going to work for the city of Lake Charles, and I heard him say the name Tom Trahan. He said, "I think Tom's going to do great things over there." And I was like, "Oh, okay." So some that was my first inkling okay. that. Okay, there was a change of the guard. Yeah, somebody knew there, yeah. Yeah, and I didn't realize that. And so I had to make a, a printing delivery or something over there one day. And that was the first time I got to actually put a face with huh. the name. And in fact, I just the other day, I don't remember who the artist was, but I, I had taken some pictures in the gallery that day. There were some paintings of some faces that were really colorful. And uh, you and I got to visit, and I just remember thinking, man, what I uh, just sort of bright... <laughs> feeling that you had about oh, wow. you i don't know <laughs> i just great. thought you just you fit you fit to me like the idea of somebody that uh should be running that kind of place i don't I appreciate know that yeah maybe that's i, I have a, a pretty i feel like a pretty strong customer service background i worked for my father-in-law well at the time he was not my father-in-law but i worked at stage back when i was in school and um my um my current father-in-law who was then my boss he imprinted a lot of really good um uh what do you call it customer service traits on me like it just just showing kindness to all the customers and you know all that kind of thing and it just that stuck with me and i found that when you are that guy and when you are able to be uh, approachable and you know kind across the board regardless of how the person looks or how they are dressed or how they act or whatever you get things <laughs> you get better things from them whether it's better results or response or and then not only that they begin to show kindness back as well in most cases and so it's just easier to be nice if that makes any sense yeah. if you want to be confrontational and, and rude and in retaliation for some way that a person is acting you're going to get that in return in most cases nobody's going to then soften and take your side or whatever but it's it's hard to be rude to a nice guy and so i I, you know, not to say that as a manipulative technique or anything, but it has certainly made things easier by just being, um, being that, that guy, being able to be that guy that you can, he's, you know, you get the reputation of being easy to work with and you get the reputation of being willing to bend over backwards for someone else when they need something or when they are, um, looking for assistance with something. And, uh, it, it's, it's a positive thing all around when you're nice to other people and it's it's i don't know it's maybe we're just wired that way as humans to be cooperative or whatever but uh I, that's that's my theory anyway it's interesting that you just said that because i think um there was probably a time and maybe even quite a number of years where i probably lived in a worldview unfortunately that had that was quite the opposite you just said that we're wired to be cooperative and so i kind of went through a stage in my life where I believed that and I tried to live by that and then I think I got maybe punched in the face a few too many times yeah, that happens too. <laughs> trying that and I, I think I lost my fervor for it and so then I become a little jaded and say oh we're not wired for that we're actually wired for conflict and and it really bothered me for a great number of years because that was where I kind of got stuck but you know through circumstances as life does it sort of recycles you washes you out and puts you back out in the game again yeah. and uh it gave me and now i have a sort of renewed sense of hope that's a lot more alignment i mean i am having to i do believe it but i have to show myself that i have to keep i have to work to remind myself that we are cooperative and that we can't and honestly this show is a manifestation of that i mean it's my desire to maybe selfishly remind myself and others that it's not you know all a cycle of negativity out there there sure. are good people that that do believe that and function that way instinctively just as you described it right right um i don't know i guess you know going back to that original uh where i keep jumping back to it because i guess i keep missing the point i'm trying to make is that you know in your position one of the beautiful things i think is that for instance you have now been through what three different you're in three different mayors Oh, that's correct. Yeah. So, you know, and an interesting thing to me about that as somebody who lives here, I look at that and go, you know, while leadership may change, there are certain people in our area who become pillars in a, in a sense where people go, hey, things are going to be OK as long as such and such is in this position or in this role. And sure. I, I honestly 
would say that you're one of those people. I, I kind of long for that stability. I would definitely not my, call myself a pillar. I might be like a, <laughs> a, a, a spoke on an umbrella or something. But uh, but I definitely feel like uh, I'm able to contribute in a positive way to the, the culture of our area or whatever. Just our, our exhibits and stuff, we only reach so, so far. I mean, we have – there are people in town, believe this or not, that won't come to an art show. It's just not – they're not into that. They don't think that it's their thing. But – they might have children and so we do children's art shows that we do get some of those people in every now and then so we do reach a, a, a pretty broad spectrum of people in the community but um as a whatever you call that a spinoff of this this part of the conversation it's one of the reasons i like getting involved with other organizations uh as well because i feel like i'm able to impact just through either a, a vote or a um you know, throwing out a uh, an idea in a you know parish subcommittee or something like that, um, I'm able to sort of direct um, little minor tweaks to the area. And that don't take this the wrong way. I'm not saying I've changed anything personally, but I like being involved in those kinds of conversations because I feel like real growth comes out of some of that. Yeah. Um, like as an example, I've served on the arts council board for a while, and I, I had a good run of that. I was able to see the ins and outs of like grant administration and that sort of thing. So. Um, going back to the spirit of cooperation as an uh, example of that, like I've uh, been approached by a couple of local nonprofits that have issues with, uh, they don't know how to write a grant or they've, they've never written one. They're very intimidated by the process. And so I've uh, been able to sit down with them and say, you know, here's a, here's how I do it. And just, I will, I will lay out my entire process for writing a grant to any other organization. Some people might see that as like, Oh, that's, you're feeding the competition with, you know, the tools to get, but you know, if we, if we, if we all get better, then, you know, we, we will all be better. So it's, it's, it is a, Comp- it's a competitive thing, but at the same time, if you cooperate, well, then they're going to come back to me next time with, hey, I found this to be effective or whatever. Um, or, hey, I have an idea for this kind of art show or something, and my members now want to participate in my gallery uh, or in your in your gallery because you've helped us with this, this, this trial that we had or whatever. Um, one thing that I've really that I'm not a fan of and, and that I don't think I would ever do is, is actually write a grant for another organization. Cause I feel like if you do it yourself, you now know how to, to do it. Well, like the, the teach Amanda fish thing, you know, sure. I could give, uh, I could write grants for other people and, you know, uh, charge them for it or whatever and make more money myself. But then the next time they need a grant written and I'm not available or something, they suffer for it. So if they go through the trial themselves and, and write it themselves, then they can they can learn from that and, you know, and get better. Or yeah. Well, then the knowledge gets passed along. I right. mean, you know, you're not the keeper of the flame. If something ever happens to Tom, then somebody else has that knowledge that that's, you know, it's incredible that we think of that as almost progressive thinking now, you mm-hmm. know, but now, but that's the way things have kind of always been. I only, I only think it maybe in the modern world and I say modern, I'm mean, talking about the last, you know, a thousand years, 500 years that humanity really has begun to become uh, more selfish and hoard for itself and, and look at people as the other really in an almost uh, poisonous kind of way, because, even nature functions the way you're what you're describing right. it's, it's a giving it's a sharing it's a it's an ecosystem it's a everything is working in sort of a balance a harmony of balances you know something when something needs a resource or a nutrient it's it's brought in it's it's not just uh it happens right and that's how things flourish i don't know i think what you're describing is really just a good model for that i hope so <laughs> Yeah. So, so I'm very curious. So when you were growing up in Sulphur, mm-hmm. uh, and like me, the Brimstone Museum really was, that was over on Fra- at the Frash, um, or yeah, the golf was, course kind um, of area. It was right in there. the Frash Park area on uh, Parish Road, it, yeah. next right next door to the um, the little pool. They had a community pool that we would actually go and swim. My parents would bring. Yeah, us, I remember uh, that to that little place. And uh, I I, I want to say I can remember going. I don't remember if it was for class or just if my mom brought us one day. I remember going, and uh, I was young. I probably maybe. Uh, Maybe too young to read anything at that point. I don't really recall, but I just remember there being a lot of stuff in there. It was a lot of artifacts, and it was just things on top of things, and it felt like a, a flea market where you couldn't really buy anything. And um, I remember there being some caretakers that they were very knowledgeable as well. They they were sort of like the uh, the little old ladies that ran the place, but they were very 
uh, keen and they knew all the the story or whatever. Um, but I don't remember there being any like uh, real narrative history of of sulfur. And in fact, a uh, uh, years later of course whenever i was made director of the place um they did host traveling exhibits and things like that but there was no real permanent um exhibit uh there was a plan for one that was a pretty expensive you know multi-million dollar project or whatever and they had a um a good idea of what they wanted but they didn't really have a way to to get there they they thought about some fundraising campaigns and things like that so so when i first started there i looked at that and thought well i don't think that this area could really support that and i began i began kind of um trimming and and uh editing and making it you know paring it down to where it was something we could afford in the area and you know in 2014 with the the city's centennial we we opened that up that was a whole a whole big ordeal and it uh it it, it was awesome i think it, it was a good thing for our community because now we have a story that we can share with people you know off the interstate or even field trips you know uh, yeah all the ball teams that come to town from all over the place that they're outsiders that are coming to this little industrial town in southwest louisiana and they get to see what we're all about just you know in our exhibits and stuff so how many visitors i mean on average a year do you think y'all bring through there that's a really hard question hard to answer to yeah that. um it, it varies from year to year um you know in maybe anywhere from eight to ten thousand i'd say is a rough guess um that's also including our festival traffic which is pretty consider yeah. considerable and then uh it also c- counts all of like our art show openings and stuff like that with five with five buildings in our complex um we sort of track attendance as a whole and so you know one visitor might be a guy who came to an art show one year and never even entered the brimstone part of the building right that was actually going to be my next question is what's the migration from someone who comes to an art show how many you know go take that second step and then go over to the brimstone or vice versa yeah if it's during like an opening it's almost none because one building will be closed after hours while we're in the others but if it's during the day traffic almost everybody will walk to see all the things that are on display um three of the buildings have constant action so the henning house the uh or the henning cultural center the brimstone museum and the mines house typically has furniture from around the uh, 1890s to the 1920s it's haven't been in there yet yeah that one's we're actually still working on the uh the furniture in that building so that's kind of a a temporarily open kind of thing it's by appointment only kind of and then uh in the brimstone we have our big railroad display now so that's kind of an ongoing uh fun you know exhibit there and then in the hitting house we'll have our art shows and it's a cultural center so we we have other kinds of rotating exhibits as well so um, yeah we're working on next year's schedule for that so yeah and so for people who don't understand the dynamic i i i don't know you might not want to talk about this you talk about it every day i'm sure but uh I think it's important for people, especially people who live in sulfur, who don't really understand the dynamic between um, the city of sulfur and then your facilities. Okay, so because see, I think maybe a lot of people who don't scratch below the paint just assume that that's all just the city of sulfur itself. Right. The government is, is managing that. Well, to to go, I guess it's it's a big long story, but to to distill it down, you have three entities that work closely together. Um, and it's a patchwork quilt of who owns what and where. So the property that the Brimstone Museum and office sit on belong to the city of Sulphur and are leased by the Brimstone for the next hundred years. I see. Or a hundred years from 2014. So gotcha. okay. we've, uh, we established that when we put our permanent display. Then where the Henning House, the Mines House, and the, um, the Annex are, those three buildings, those all sit on uh, Sulphur Parks and Recreation's property. And the Brimstone Historical Society, which is a nonprofit 501c3, we are the administrators of all five buildings on the campus. So gotcha. as an independent, uh, whatever you call it, entity, we handle the day-to-day uh, of the facility, the programs, the events, the schedule, the activities, all that comes through the Brimstone uh, Historical Society. I see. Okay. And so that and so it's interesting because there's a soul synergy that happens at that whole sure. corner right there. I guess what Heritage Square, is that right. what that's called? So you got the Grove and then you've got the Pavilion. Right. The Grove is the Sulphur Parks and Recreation. The City of Sulphur runs the Pavilion and the Bathroom Pod. And then beyond the hedges is all, I'm the administrator of that property from right. the Henning House, the five buildings in that complex. Um, 
and we're managing property that belongs to someone else, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. Okay. And it's very confusing. Like it is very common for the, the, the Christmas lights have to go up kind of early every year because there's a lot to put up. So Sulphur Parks and Recreation will send out crews and dress the Henning House for Christmas. And it's it never fails. It's almost every single year that someone will complain to the city of Sulphur that they have started decorating too early because it's not even Halloween yet. Or it's, you know, uh, how can you start decorating? We haven't even had Thanksgiving yet. So it's that that's a very common thing for people to call the wrong entity complaining about something. Uh, but, you know, it, it's something that hopefully over time people will figure out as we are more visible in the community or whatever. Sure. I mean, and Sulphur is not the only city that's got that kind of situation. Um, we do a little bit of work up in Natchitoches, Louisiana, and they've got a similar I guess confusion, so to speak. Sure. There's so many different entities who all have Natchitoches in the name, and they do all work together collectively, just as you described, like a patchwork quilt, especially during Christmas time, because it's they have to work together. Sure. Oh, the, yeah. But there's these sort of um, soft breezeways, I guess, between each of those entities and overlapping services, and so getting to the right one sometimes is a bit of a bear. Oh, sure, absolutely, yeah. And in our case, it's. Uh, it's especially hard for me in, in some cases because, uh, you know, people think that I'm a city employee or something and I have sure. all these great benefits and money and, and I'm scratching for every dollar the organization can bring in so that we can, you know, afford to keep maintenance up. Well, sure, because you're still fundraising. And, I oh, mean, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. on top of. Yeah, it's not, I can't just call the city and say, hey, I need more money. Like, that's not how any of that works. So that's fascinating. So you saying that, that makes me realize, I mean, considering all the substantial changes that have went on over there. That's uh, pretty impressive. Oh yeah, it, it's it's all like you know we we will get funding from the city or from SPAR with special requests, but a lot of it's grant writing. It's um, we we send out sponsorship requests to industries and local businesses to fund specific programs and. Um, we partner with other organizations like uh, give you an example our film festival that we host uh, twice a year there's a short film festival in the May time frame and then another in October which is our, our regular film festival that's actually the uh, Louisiana film and video art uh, or nonprofit, they're another nonprofit that partners with us. Well, they pay for all the the rights to use the films, and they advertise for the event, and a lot of the, and they pay for a celebrity to come in and stuff. It, that's all on their expense. I just provide a place for them to do it. That was one of my early kind of inside jokes, like with board members and things, is that you know the, the idea is you come up with the dream and you have this vision for how it happens, and then the second step is figure out how to get other people to pay for it. Like I have <laughs> right. to like sell my ideas to someone else and say, hey, now you need to give me ten thousand dollars so that we can see this happen in our community and um, I you know it I kind of throw that out as a joke but that is how it works you know you you, you have to be able to have a project that people find is worth funding so yeah what project for you in this time period I mean there maybe there's several I'd like to hear about all of them I'm sure you've got like some top five top three that you go hey I I was a part of this and I wasn't sure it was gonna succeed but it's really rolled out and now it's sort of a staple to your organization and your property and even for mm. the city, something that people really look forward to that you go, hey, this this worked. This yeah, that's, out. that's a hard question. Um, I mean, we do a lot of different things. It, it, I'll give you one that's a, a on the surface, totally unsuccessful, but on the uh, on the inside track, I find very fun and interesting. We do an event in, with that Louisiana Film and Video Art Organization. Uh, we do an event in uh, July, usually, that's called Serial Fest, where we uh, open up one of the buildings, whether it's the Annex or the Brimstone. We've held it in there in the past. Um, and for the whole day, it's on a Saturday from like 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And for the whole day, we just show old serials from the 30s and 40s, like the old Tarzan movies. Oh, cool. And they're like the 30-minute episodes. of that They would uh -huh. air these before a, a feature film. And uh, what you would do is in those days, you would go back the next week to, to watch the same movie you watched the week before but there'd be a new episode of the serial before the show. So for huh. that Saturday, we show those all day long, just the serials. And um, it's it's very poorly attended most of the time. How many people? What do you, what do you consider uh, 10, poorly? 10 to 15 okay. for the whole day. Right. Yeah, we'll have like a, a group that might come in, like a, a husband and wife or a grandfather with two kids, and they'll stay for an episode or three or whatever. And then they'll, uh, and then they'll head out. For me, I'm there the whole day because I'm operating the projector. And I get to just watch cool old films in my museum um, all day long instead of doing like real work. So that's a uh, that's for me one of my favorites throughout the the year to do. Um, we do another one that's a lot of fun uh, in October, which uh, is our um, 
it used to be in September, but it's our Boudin Wars event. Mm -hmm. It's a partnership with the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, yeah. They provide funding for the event, and then we uh, get some restaurants together, and we uh, it's a food-based event. I don't think anyone has ever attended that event, at least not to me, has complained. They it, There's plenty of food. The price is reasonable. It's a good fundraiser for us. Um, and so, and people come out and they enjoy it. it we do it in conjunction with the City of Sulphur's uh, Stars and Stripes in the Park Car Show. Yeah, that feels like one big just event. And, and, it is. And, and it's, it's a good case of like a lot of, of uh, cooperation. Um, so the, the car show uh, at one point last year decided they had to move because there was a hurricane. Hurricane Harvey came through. Yeah. And a lot of the people that attend the car show come from that area of Texas that was affected. Oh, okay. And so they pushed the car show to October. And there was some conversation in the beginning to say like, well, is this going to, I mean, is this going to affect Boudin Wars or what are y'all going to do for your part of the event? And, you know, we just, we said, no, we, we enjoy this cooperation so much. It benefits us and it benefits y'all. We, we followed their event. So that, yeah. that's been a, that, that for me is one of my favorites. Uh, another little like inside joke of the event managing or whatever uh industry i don't know if this is true for everyone but it's certainly true for me like when there's a food related event or food at an event i almost never get a chance to eat like it's <laughs> it's just inevitable i'm not going to get any food and uh you can just bank on it for for, my, for me anyway um part of it i'm just nervous the whole time i couldn't probably keep it down if i ate it and the other part is that there's just no time there's too much to kind of handle sure uh, there's always little miniature fires to put out, and if you do get a break, you don't want to eat. You want to sit for a minute in silence. For Man, just I actually a totally understand. See, I film a lot of events, and um, we recently just filmed the uh, whiskey and barbecue festival mm -hmm. in Lake Charles, and uh, that's the same thing for me. I mean, I'm not coordinating the event most of the time for any of those types of things, but it's usually working at the event behind the camera, and it you know hours and hours and hours will go by because I'm chasing shots the whole time, sure. and. If I'm not careful, especially at food events, I start to find that my mind gets a little uh, frazzled oh. because I start to get hungry and I don't realize I'm hungry and then I'm filming all this food. You're and I'm, surrounded, yeah. At some point, though, I've noticed that every one of those events, I start to get a little bit of like a... Um, yeah, have you ever just been so thirsty? It's like, you know, when you're a kid, you're like, man, I run to that water fountain and just like drink on it so you're sick. Yeah, absolutely. I'm always... If I get any food at all at those things, I... I I'm like, I want more it's right. just because I've, I mean, I hit that point where, uh, you just but, want to overindulge. At that yeah, point, yeah. Yeah. And so I usually just will skip it because I know if I can just get through it, get through the event because yeah, it's the same thing. I'm running around and crazy, but of course the food's right in front of your face all the time. So it's yeah. a little different. <laughs> you see people walking by with these trays of awesome food. It's like, man, I'd like to do that, but you know, I got to carry these trash bags over there. And <laughs> yeah. So what's your road to get to this? I mean, so take, I mean, take me back if you don't mind, I'd love to know. Cause I, I've known you. For a good while now. Yeah. I mean, we've been friends for probably, I don't know, since around 2009, I'd say, 2010, something like that. Somewhere in like there, that. yeah, for sure. I mean, we don't see each other every day, but, I mean, we spend a lot of time around each other. Right. And But I don't know that I've ever really... I don't know I don't know what your road is to Brimstone and Henning. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, um, I'll go back as far as maybe college. So yeah. went to college at Louisiana College. I, I followed my then girlfriend at the time. I had scholarships to a few other different schools and um, didn't really know, I guess, what I wanted to do with my life yet. I mean, as many people are at that stage. Sure. But um, I kind of had an idea that I was going to take a business, uh, business management or business marketing course and do something in the offices at the end industries around here and so I started that path at uh, at LC over in Pineville area and uh, you know I was I was in there for maybe two years before I realized it just wasn't for me I didn't like the the numbers and the I don't know the it's not not a good way to say it but the professional no sure of, I understand <laughs> though yeah I mean the facilitating of that yeah. I mean it's a lot of yeah uh, and I and I was always a, a fan of history I read a lot as a kid and and even as an adult um, or a young adult I, I like to read and history was always a um, a draw for me and um, I wouldn't necessarily say a passion but it, it has become that um, and so I switched to a history major and an uh, education minor and that's what I graduated with so um, in 2002, when my uh, when my girlfriend at the time graduated, we got married, and I still had about a year's left of school. So I started working as a uh, as an IT guy at one of the um, I didn't know that industries up there. Yeah, did that for a couple of years. Uh, in the midst of that, I graduated with my degree in history and a minor in uh, education, and um, s just didn't like it. Got got jaded by the whole thing. IT work is hard if you're not wired that way. Um, it's just people complain 
all the time. You don't ever get calls to say, hey, my computer's been working great this week. You yeah. know, thanks for all your hard work. It's always, my mouse is broken. It's somehow your fault. And, you know, <laughs> I need you to come and fix it immediately. I don't care what you're doing. So, um, so I, I didn't enjoy that. So I ended up leaving that and I went into retail again because that was like a good fallback for me. I enjoyed retail. I like people. I like being around other people, small groups of people. Big crowds make me really nervous. But so, um, I worked at a Radio Shack in the mall in Alexandria for a little while, as you do, you know, with a history degree and no <laughs> right, degree. right. Many many degrees are like that, right? So, uh, and uh, at a certain point, we decided we wanted to move back home. My wife was teaching at the time; she is has always been a teacher. I, I even think when she was a kid, she was a teacher, you know. <laughs> um, so we ended yeah. up um, moving back to our hometown. We we always loved sulfur. We loved being around our family and stuff. So we moved back here, and I began working in. Uh, I think my first job in town was uh, at the Holiday Inn, which used to be on Ruth Street. Oh, yeah, I remember Street. that. Yeah. The one that was like in really bad shape. And, look, and I remember the look that was the, cla- the old brand Holiday Inn. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I worked there for uh, a little while through um, Katrina, uh, where actually I can remember some vivid memories. We had a little computer lounge in there, maybe two or three workstations. And I can remember people... Uh, evacuating Katrina and as they would stop in uh, I would help some of them fill out FEMA forms on their on our little computer really? in there yeah I can remember pointing them to the right site and then like you know this is where you enter this information just type all this in and so there were a handful of people that I did that with um, wow and then when Rita hit I was still working there and I can I was I was working with another employee so I was night audit that was always my favorite because there aren't a whole lot of people that come through when you work late night at a hotel and the ones that do come through are just fascinating to talk to if you see someone showing up at a hotel at 2 a.m. there's a story there (laughs) and so as a person who's maybe maybe that's why I fit so well in a museum is that I'm a story driven person I like to know more about people's lives and I want to ask questions like well what are you into why are you into that and so hotels are a great place for that plus you don't really get to see the same people all the time Time, it's almost always new people. So, long story short, through some some payroll things and stuff at that place, uh, I got really just burned out with the management, and I, I quit my job there, which was a really, I mean, that was a really soul crushing kind of moment. So I've, I had never really quit a job for a negative reason. I quit mm. to move, or I would quit to go work somewhere else as an upgrade or whatever. This was this felt like I had to get out of that place. So. I uh, moved across the street, basically, and we started working at the Fairfield Inn in Sulphur, which was an all-around awesome experience. I uh, worked with great people, um, enjoyed most of my time there. Um, it was work, so I mean, every day was different, but uh, but I loved it. I loved meeting people and all that. I got to where I was driving the van for pilots as they would land in the Lake Charles Airport. They needed a place to stay, yeah. and somehow they had a contract with a Sulphur Hotel to where we would drive a van and pick them up and drive them back and they would overnight at the hotel. So I would drive the night van, go back home and go to bed, and then I would come back the next morning and drive the morning van and bring them back to uh, back to the um, the airport so they could catch their morning flights out. Um, that was another interesting thing is these pilots, they had stories because they were from everywhere. Yeah, so that and van you're ride, probably, your mind's lighting up, right? You're oh, going, yeah. oh, this is my world right here. Oh, totally. So that was great. Well, while I had that job, that's when I got uh, a call from my mother-in-law that a job was open at the museum. And I believe it was the director position at the time. So I went and took my application and applied for a job, and it, it ended up going to someone else. And uh, so that, you know, I, I kind of put it in the back of my mind, well, it just wasn't meant to be or whatever. And then not too long after that, I got a call that the assistant position was open. And I thought, well, hey, that's a foot in the door. Maybe one day this new director will go on, and I'll then be able to step into yeah. her shoes and go from there, which in, is exactly what happened. She was a Baton Rouge native and had come to town and was working here at the museum for I guess maybe a year or maybe two years and I worked with her for a while and then when she decided to move back home with her family in Baton Rouge um, they told me well you're you're here you have a history degree you seem to be working hard and you seem to have a passion for your town so would you like to take that position and I jumped at it I said absolutely I'd love that at the time there were two buildings in the complex it wasn't a complex. It was just two buildings. Two at buildings, that time. Yeah. yeah. It was the old railroad depot and then the big two story, uh, the Henning House. Yeah. So from there, it just it's just a story of, of growth and building and, you know, I guess getting, uh, like I said earlier, getting people to pay for things you come up with, ideas you come up with. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, so much has changed. I, I One thing that I think is unique about you, and I mean, this is just from knowing you personally and then seeing the way you handle yourself. One, you just appear to me to be everywhere. And I mean, you may not feel that way, but I look and I go, Tom, I see Tom everywhere. He's on this board. He's involved in this activity. Um, there's always something going on. Yeah. And you even said it a minute ago. I mean, you work the events. You're not just sitting back going, okay, the event unfolds. I mean, you're there working these events. Yeah, I like to be very involved. And that's actually a, a calculated uh, thing. I love seeing myself in the media. No, I hate every part of that. It just happens that way sometimes that you're just, you, you are the, the, the person that's doing the well, thing. Well, speaking of that, I got a question. I mean, have you ever felt like being in the media has been a, I mean, like, have you ever been in the media and felt like, that didn't come out right, or that wasn't portrayed properly, or maybe there was a miscommunication. I'm always curious about that. I mean, not really. I mean, I don't. I think my um, my whatever you call it, not my dislike of being in the media is more my own self. Uh, what do you call it? A uh, self-conscious uh, sure. mentality. Like I am very self-conscious. I feel like I have. I'll give you a good example. When when people call me on the phone or a telemarketer, or if I call a doctor's office, I get yes, ma'am more often than yes, sir. Like they, really, my voice is a little bit higher. I guess I sound really? like a woman who smokes too much or something like that. <laughs> I never would have thought that, but and, I mean, and maybe I'm, I'm so like my my. Uh, whatever you call it, my lack of confrontation, I will almost never correct them. I'll just roll with it and continue. And then if they ever figure it out, like, oh, well, you, uh, I'm sorry about that. Like, it, it's not a big deal. It's happened my whole life. So if I called you Miss Tom, you would sure, be fine whatever. with that. Like, just Miss Tom. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah. You know, I think once you know, it's it, that at that point, it's offensive. <laughs> but uh, yeah. but uh, anyway, that all, so that's, that's one of those things that I've always had that kind of, um, self-deprecating worldview like there are many other people out there who are better than me i'm just going to try to make a go at it yeah. um so yeah that's anytime i hear my voice on the radio or see myself on television it's a, always a negative experience for me even if it's a good portrayal and people say like oh you did a great job i don't see it that way like i just see it as another you know another missed attempt at being cool <laughs> you know what man i gotta say and jump in here with that and i've talked about this on the show quite a bit i have the exact same thing i avoid cameras um if i don't have to take a picture i won't um if someone you know says there's going it's going to be on tv i'm i really have to get over i have this an anxiety about it oh me too it just spins around and i'll hide it and deal with it but i don't love it yeah and i mean i'm burying it and, and a lot of times i have to get it out some other way because it's uh it's really difficult for me. Yeah. So I, I get it. I mean, that's partly, again, why I think I gravitated finally. Well, I'll give you an, a great example of that. Do you remember, uh, and this isn't the only reason we'd ended up not launching it, but I was going to do a, um, a show. And I think we filmed it over oh, at yeah. Bernstein. Do you I remember? do remember We came that, and did yeah. a big production. Well, right after we filmed that, my father passed away. And that yeah. just, all my passion for that project just drained into the ground. I mean, I just, mm-hmm. just couldn't find it in myself. And, uh, but I, I did try to re- revive it, and I was like, well, let me go into the editing. It was probably a year later, and I went back to edit that. And, you know, I was in it as the host. Right. Couldn't deal with it. I mean, and I told my wife, I said, you know, I don't know. I said, I guess I'm just not there yet. I said, I'm this old, and I've still got these things. I just can't do this. I don't think I'm going to be able it, to yeah. be the host of the show and be in front of that camera like that. Um and I don't know what it is. I just can't put my finger on it. But there's a strange anxiety it gives me. Just something very, very strange. I just don't know where it comes from. But I think it's the idea of putting yourself out there and for other people to look at and and and, and poke at or whatever. Like I, I always had this fear, even in school, that I was going to be picked on. So as a result, I developed a very self-deprecating sense of humor. I made myself the easy target so that it was like people would look bad for picking on the the you know dorky little nice kid you know like it's it's yeah so by picking on my own self i think i may have decayed some of my own self-confidence or whatever that way yeah and uh so as a result like i say i just i don't i don't i'm not able to watch stuff i'm on i probably won't listen to this podcast so <laughs> your viewer account's gonna be down by one at least for oh, this man. one but uh, well you know it's funny i gotta jump in and tell you this and i know i told you this in private but i just want it to be known on this show too when I started putting it out there, I'm actually, I didn't even put it out there. When I first started, I had the idea that, well, the show will build itself. You know, um, I go to all these awards, you know, a lot of times f- taking pictures and there's always somebody getting an award for something, sure. serving the community in some way. 
And when I go film those things, I think, you know, how many years does this take? Because they only have so many awards each year. Most of them have their like their set ones they right. give every year. If I did that for 10 years, some of the people who are doing good work may never be recognized. You right. know, it's always going to be like the new crop of people, if that makes any yeah, sense. It does. You know, and a lot sense. of times some of the awards are given away. Yeah, for lifetime stuff. But sometimes it's like, hey, we need to give this award to this person because they're very popular right now and there's a lot of tailwind with them. Right. So it's very good to bring them in and give them that recognition, attach them to your organization. And in that conversation that I was having with somebody, I said, you know, maybe in some small way we can build a show that can become sort of an unsung award where people will go, hey, I know somebody who's never been recognized. Yeah, that's I know cool. somebody who's doing something and I can't give them a piece of glass, but I can give you their name and then you can maybe get them on the show. And it's a way for us to give them a pat on the back, yeah. you know, and say, Hey, thank you for just being good for our community. Right. Right. Um, where was I going with that? So hmm, I don't even remember show building itself. Yeah. The show building itself. So, yeah. So anyway, I, I, I said, look, when we start, I'll have my own list of names. I'll contact some people, and then I'll just put it out there. Well, I mean, as soon as I did a couple of episodes and people saw what it was, I started getting emails, like, every day. Huh. And, you know, DMs and Facebook messages and texts. And I was like, holy cow. I mean, this is poor. This people could are, be a big thing, yeah. This could be a thing. Like, there's an unstoppable list of people out there. and But the frequency of your name from every out of everybody's name i've had some duplication but this is you and a couple of other people whose names keep coming up but out of everybody your name just kept coming up and so i started that's, chasing you at that point i was very like surprising <laughs> yeah so to hear you say that um, i hope i didn't disappoint all of you <laughs> no i don't think that it's disappointing honestly to if, if anything it just for me it just reveals even further that that it's true i mean knowing that you have those things like that inside yourself and yet you struggle with them in your own way to whatever capacity you have to and still get out there and do the thing that's good for your community i mean man that's that's pretty impressive yeah thank you i appreciate that a lot yeah because you know how hard it is oh yeah oh definitely um yeah, it's not an easy thing for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, like you said, we we know each other. <laughs> we yeah. know each other, and even this, right? You, the, you know, a microphone's on, and all of a sudden, it's like there's a whole other level. It's of... a nervousness that you don't really think you <laughs> yeah. can prepare for, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I know. I did an interview over the phone with Adobe, uh, the company that makes Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop and the whole suite and all that, uh, a couple of years ago. And I mean, I think I was on the phone for two hours, and I think the first hour was just these me going. <sighs> Before every answer, you know, like oh, yeah. <laughs> taking a big deep breath and just like trying <laughs> to calm the anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, I guess because in my mind I'm thinking, I, I guess I place them on a pedestal somewhere, right? When realistically, I guess I had to learn over time that they're, they're just it's a person on the other end of the phone. And I think another thing too for me is like sitting across the table. We talk about how you know this is uh, it's difficult at, at a certain level. I think for me, it's the it's the the conversation topic talking about myself. Sure. If we were talking about just you know the exhibit or the brimstone or whatever, it's a whole different. I can almost go into like a robot mode, and I know all the stuff, and I'm confident in my my knowledge on the subject matter. But to try to talk about your own personal personality or whatever and to try to verbalize something that maybe you hadn't thought about before or whatever like it just that's a whole different level of of anxiety that i don't think it's it's a lot harder to prepare for you know yeah well because i mean you don't know what i'm over here thinking about asking you right it can be anything in fact i do want to ask you something that i thought of while we were just talking oh no well i, I guess you know ultimately you're Something you said earlier, you know, about uh, changing things generationally, it's mm -hmm. very important to me, too, in whatever small way, passing something on. But uh, have you ever, do you have any stories, and I'd love to hear one from you if you do, where you remember something that y'all did over there that uh, really just impacted a single person where you just know this this really helped somebody or, or it touched somebody or they told you something that that you uh, um, were, were surprised by. Okay, I, okay. So this is not something that's related to to me personally. Um, but here's a here's a good one that happened at one point a few years ago. There was a group of us that got together. Uh, people in the community, uh, the the Minds Theater got involved. Several churches, like Houston River Baptist Church, uh, the SC3. We, we were trying to get something together for the Christmas uh, holidays, 
And um, this group that got together, it, it worked out that we had something like 12 days worth of activities that were going on around the same time. Christmas Under the Oaks took three of those days. Uh, one group stepped forward and wanted to do an old time Christmas brunch for like the, the senior citizens in the community. One group wanted to do um, uh, caroling in the grove, like just a ecumenical, like any church could come, any group could come. Yeah. You want to just bring your family and sing Christmas carols just to kind of bring everyone together in the public square or whatever to sing Christmas carols because that's something everybody I think can do. I mean, it's in secular movies, it's in religious movies, it's all over. So it's yeah. something we all do, in other words. Uh, so we had these these activities planned and one of the activities was called uh scripture reading in the grove oh i've been to that yeah and they okay. had a podium set up and they had churches that signed up for time slots to come and just to just gather at the grove and just read it wasn't for performance or for any kind of uh whatever you want to call it um it wasn't to show off or anything it was just you know there's a bible out come up and read for a little while and be and different people off. from different from different faiths and churches right, right? absolutely yeah. it was from okay. all over yeah and so uh it ended up um at the end of the day so it was a sun up to sundown thing so they started early in the morning and they ran it all day long and just with non-stop there was an i remember at one point there was a lady out there clutching the podium as it was raining and windy and everything else and it was this little old lady and it was really it was sad, but she. This was her. This was her conviction. I need to be here doing this at this moment, regardless of what else is happening. Sure. At the end of the day, somebody noted, and I'm going to be butchering the story hey. for anybody involved. You can call in or and complain about me. <laughs> I'll take but, it. <laughs> um, but this, uh, at the end of the day, there was a group that was out there doing this reading, and uh, there was a man on the podium, I believe, and a woman. Uh, who was there with him just for support and stuff, and they noticed someone sleeping on one of the benches or sitting on one of the benches uh, in the grove. And so this woman walked over and started up a conversation with this woman and said, uh, with this this girl on the bench, and said, uh, you know, hey, what, what's what's going on? You know, what are you doing? And the the girl had mentioned that she was waiting for everybody to clear out so she could take a nap, she could go to sleep for the night because she was going to sleep here under this bench. And the woman said, uh, you know, that's not that's not right. Let me let me talk to some friends of mine who have, you know, maybe we get you some clean clothes or a good meal or something, and then uh, and then we'll let you get back to sleeping under the bench. Yeah. So you know, fast some forward a little assistance. bit. Yeah, yeah. So fast forward a little bit. They called uh, Jody Farnham at at Care Help and said, you know, here's this need. Um, this person is here, and from here, I don't, I'm not familiar with the entire rest of the story, but I do know that she got connected with the group and got something to eat and got some clothes out of their um out of their collection or whatever you want to call it and um they got her to talk a little bit more about her family and you know she had been running from her family and she's uh you know she had problems with addictions and things like that and just i think the comment was made that um we're just uh they don't want me nobody nobody wants me i'm a burden to my family and i don't want to go back or whatever so they, they ended up getting this girl's grandmother on the phone and the grandmother had been looking for her like since she had been missing and had been searching and searching and searching and just was so upset that they thought that she had they knew she had run away and that she had possibly even died or something and sure, so they were probably distraught didn't know right this was during that that window of christmas or whatever and so the end result of that is she was re reunited with her grandmother and before like christmas and it, that's just that's oh, like you, you can't make this up and it's like that's a story that happened from something that a group of us sat at a table and said we think we need to do something bigger i guess yeah. for what for what our community has and as a result somebody i feel like their life got changed for the better absolutely i, I don't know what happened beyond that with this girl or her family or um i, I don't know her reasons for for fully leaving her family or whatever but I do know that that was a very touching thing for me, and Absolutely. that's one of the God. reasons I got more in, more connected to Care Help in Sulphur, uh, because at that moment I saw them as they're, they're not just a thrift store at all. They're they're absolutely there to to better the community in a way that I could never better the community. They're feeding people and clothing people, and I think it was that day or the day after that when I heard the story that I became like a kind of an evangelist for the the Care Help Church, yeah. if that makes sense. No, it they're does. not a church, but I mean, I, I don't understand that. I, I feel like they are operating as the the hands of of, of God or no, way, yeah, in, in sure. a certain way. So uh, that's that's kind of uh, you know my my two cents on that subject. <laughs> I'm glad you shared that story, and you know you you and I've talked about that privately. But I mean, being an evangelist for Care Help is not a bad thing because you know what. But man we need frontline stuff like that because i mean we i told my wife this last saturday there was a um a conflict in our neighborhood and 
it required ah man i mean i find it hard to talk about it because it was very emotional yeah you know but i had to really dig deep on what i say i believe in i mean sometimes Mm -hmm. in life you just have instincts and then sometimes you have to say what do i truly ask yourself in a moment what do i really believe about this like what do i really believe is the right course of action even if it goes against maybe what my my conditioning tells Mm me and so um I took that course of action out in on sheer trust and you know things didn't go so well hmm. well they did it went well initially but it didn't go so well it ended up being a very painful situation all around and so i came home you know and i told my wife i said and i was really in tears tom i mean honestly i mean if i'm being truthful i told her i said you know i've been reading and bec- well something happened to me 20 years ago that changed my life and um I would say probably every day for the last 21, 22 years, I've been trying to figure out what that, what it was that happened. Mm. And that just really created a rabid desire to read and understand anything that had to do with people changing, like really changing. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not talking about like, I've changed my mind. I'm talking about like at a core part of you, something shifts. And so I've studied Religion. I mean, not not professionally or, or at a school, but like religion and philosophy and, and just anything. Mm-hmm. And then I told her, I said, all these books, I might as well go and dump them all in the trash or light them on fire. If when the time comes for me to actually apply something, right. I'm not going to put it to the test. You know, and so I guess and that's my long way of saying when I see what you're saying about care help. That's exactly what I hear is that's the front line. That's where it matters. We can all read and talk and discuss who's right, who's wrong till we're blue in the face while our brother starves on the side of the road. Oh, sure. Absolutely. You know, uh, it, you know, it, that's so I was I was raised by television in some cases. My parents are excellent parents, but I watched a lot of like Mr. Rogers and stuff as a kid. And I mean, if I have a spirit animal or something like that, I'd be him. <laughs> He'd be my spirit <laughs> yes, animal. That's a good spirit Between animal. Mr. Rogers and the Hamburglar, you know. But uh, but that guy uh, was kindness, you know, to a to a fault in in most cases. And and he applied, in my opinion, applied Christianity. And never once on his show did he talk Christianity. And that's that's something that I've dealt with in my life. Like I, I do consider myself a Christian. I, if you apply like the modern definition of a Christian, I'm probably a bad Christian. I'm not at the same time. I, I consider myself a seeker. Like I do, you know, attempt to, to know God. And I have come to find that God is in people all around us. Um, I, I believe in miracles, like, and not necessarily supernatural miracles, but if you see your neighbor struggling and you drop 50 bucks in an envelope and stick it in his mailbox and he doesn't see you do it, to him, that came from an angel. Like, that's a, that's a miraculous thing for somebody that might not have been able to pay for a light bill or buy his kid's shoes for, for the school year or whatever. And so by opening yourself up to those types of opportunities, you will see ways that you can then um affect your community and and even just behind the scenes i'm not going to say that i do that all the time but i have done that and it's a very it's a very liberating thing to do something kind for someone else and not get any credit for it yeah and you know absolutely something that's your heart probably quivers and then you you feel you know when it's the time to act i mean you know that that's tends to be the way it is for me I've, i've said this many times that the front door of this little studio here sometimes people just come to the door and uh, most of the time what they just need is to come in and talk and so Mm -hmm. i've learned over the last few years to just make time to listen and talk to them If, if they need money if i have some i'll help them if they need assistance or connection with somebody i try to do that too and sometimes it's a spiritual conversation they have something on their heart but most of the time what i've found is that people just want somebody to listen to them and just know that their life mattered. Dude, that in the museum business, I mean, that is my number two currency. Number one is, is of course, we thrive on donations and things. But when people walk up to my door, I will clear away my desk. Whatever I'm doing is not important compared to you know, some 90-year-old man walks in and wants to talk about his time in the service. Some people might go, oh, he's going to waste my time. He's going to talk for a long, long time and then leave. But 
He just wants to be heard. And there may be a story in the middle of all that that could be used in the museum, and there may not be. But at the same time, you've you've given that person, the 90-year-old man, 20-year-old man, whatever it is, you've given that person uh, – time and what's more valuable than that you know your oh, your man, time yes and so i can't tell you the times i've had to fold up my computer and put it in my bag and bring it home and work on a grant at two in the morning because someone talked to me for four hours that afternoon but it needed to happen like that's they they came there for a reason and that conversation needed to happen and i've made a lot of good friends that way too like people that have just walked in you know you you give them 20 minutes today and then tomorrow he comes back for 45 minutes and there does come a time where you have to limit what what that kind of stuff because there are some people that are just time vampires and they will do that to take advantage but then there are lots of times that they are there because something brought them there and whether it's just because your light was on saying you're open or they were driven there by some desire to share their story to a place that'll keep it for a long time or whatever um they're there for a reason and so yeah that's that's that that second currency or whatever the ability to keep and and retell stories in my opinion is what what i thrive on at at the museum you know yeah well i mean that feeds your interest in history which you said has become a passion it's not just this not the big history it's the small history exactly it's not the it's not the dates or the the amount of troops on the beach at wherever it's it's what did that guy feel when he was there and that guy's kids what are what is the impact on them and what yeah, just hearing other people's stories, and, and I think this sounds really cheesy, but I think Oprah did a thing a while back where like every person has a story to tell or something, and she did this nationwide search for just interesting stories. And no matter who she talked to or whatever, she asked them, there was something unique to every individual, and I thought that was a really special thing. I don't remember many of the stories that she told on that little that little production or whatever. I don't think it even really took off. But I, I remember it because it, it resonated with what we do at the museum. Yeah, I think the value of one life is infinite. I mean, we we kind of live in a culture now. It's really fast. And I, I mean, I, as you were talking, it just it occurred to me that we almost have a new religion that's formed in the world. And it's the religion of um, I'm too busy. Yeah. You know, and it's the religion of me. It's a, it's a whole nother type of faith of uh, egocentric. Not that we shouldn't care about ourselves and be well. Um, but it's it's almost like a um, polarized state of, no, you're over there, I'm over here, and I'm very busy. I've got some, yeah. but, but if you, if everybody's busy, then nobody's helping each other. Nobody's <laughs> giving each other doing? time. Yeah. And what are we doing it for? Yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. So I've and I, I'm I and listening to you talk, I mean, I it reminds me of something. One of my great shames in life is any time that i've ever done that to somebody and i know i have yeah i mean i can remember times where i maybe was busy but i wasn't too busy but i perhaps feigned busyness just because i just didn't want to have to take in someone else's stuff at that time oh sure you know i felt like my mind already had my own things going on and i'm already caught in my own little tiktok clock and and I just felt like um, giving them time. And I'm really overthinking this, but these are the thoughts I have now as I get older. And I yeah. think about those times. And I, don't know, I feel ashamed, man. And I hope I've learned my lesson because I don't want to be that person. I want to I want to give people time. Yeah. You know? uh, everybody does it. Everybody's turned someone away for, for whatever reason. I mean, that's that I had a visitor the other day, one of my good friends who um, he comes by infrequently. He's not there all the time. But I was visiting with someone in the train exhibit. And he, you know, walked in to say Merry Christmas and kind of had a, a moment where I, you know, I wanted to grab him and drag him back to the office just to check on him, see how things were. And he, I mean, he was that quick out the door. He had other things to do as well, I guess. But um, I, I think he saw me with someone else and maybe thought, oh, he's too busy. I'm going to just leave. And I really, I'm bummed about that because he's always got good stories. His daughter is a nun. She joined the a nunnery. He's just yeah, well, super interesting guy. He's an artist friend of mine. And um, I, I, I relish every moment that I get to visit with somebody like that. There's all kinds of stories that just from a life that I'm not leading, it's somebody else's, you know, journey. And I'd like to hear about it if I can. So, well, I kind of think even in my business, similar to what you're talking about, I, uh, I interact with a lot of people. I interact with a lot of the same people week after week, month after month. And I mean, fully like for this year, I've probably met on an intimate level, six new people Hmm. outside of the show. So, those those things happen through business interactions and what the because the bulk of that is business related i don't get to connect with those people and i honestly it's sort of built up a little bit of a um 
uh, a deficiency where I started to realize I was having lots of conversations, but my desire to know those people goes so much further than just the projects we're working on. But there's just no time. They're so busy. I'm so busy. And I thought, you know, my desire to know what makes other people tick and to find the goodness in them and just see their lights because everybody's got them. I'm not. How am I going to do this? You know, and so this makes it a value, I guess, by saying, come sit with me at a table and talk talk with me get to know me let me get to know you chat for a while let's chat for a while it's different than seeing somebody at the store where uh, back to my you know uh what do we call it self-loathing or whatever the fact that i i have such a low self-esteem or whatever i'll see somebody i recognize in a store and pretend i don't know them and at one point i think uh i had a person that it was from someone from church like a way back number of years ago maybe even in college that saw me later on in church and was like oh you didn't say hello to me you must be really pretentious and it's like no man i was afraid you weren't going to recognize me and they're like well i see you every week you know but yeah you do you really know who i am you know my name or would you have really returned my greeting if i because i'm just i don't i don't see a whole lot of value in in uh you know, greeting someone and being blown off because that's happened once or twice and it hurts. It's no, not a sure. good feeling at all. So as a result, it's easier to just pretend they don't see you. And then when they they tap you on the shoulder, like, hey, Tom, how's it going? Like, oh, hey, that's a great feeling. Like this person took a moment to talk to little old me, you know? Yeah, I'm so. try- I know what you mean. I'm trying to learn to not be so wounded, I guess, mm-hmm. because uh, and to go, hey, uh, or maybe to not be afraid of being wounded because for so much big chunks of my life, I've either dumped my heart all in and then let whenever it got wherever I sent it, it went stab, 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 stab. And then oh, yeah. I got it back. It had a bunch of holes in it. Is that to put that thing back in my chest, you know, and go back, <laughs> go function, right. you know? Oh, yeah. And so I did that so many times that I, I think there was a big chunk where I was like a little more guarded. And so I, um, I think the term was statue face for a long time. Hmm. I would just put on a, not an unfriendly, mean, not a mean demeanor, but more like a, I'm not interested in talking demeanor, and that was to protect myself yeah. from 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 what I don't know. And as I as the years have went by, I've learned to let that down. And I, I think the person I'm who I'm supposed to be starts to come out even more. Right. The problem is that I'm an all in type, and I'll I'll give it all to you <laughs> because I want it all from you. I get <laughs> I get accused of that sometimes, or not accused of it, but I've I have been known to get real chummy with somebody on a very first meeting, like you know, cracking jokes and you know making. Uh, you know, making uh, light of, of situations we're in or whatever, and then later that person will go to someone else. Like, I have I met him before? Is that why he's being so nice to me and so jokey with me? And so that's uh that's one of my I guess flaws. If anything, I really I really do get sometimes a little overly excited to meet new people, and then uh, get real chummy and start joking before we're really they know my sense of humor and they're sure. like, "Who's this guy? What is happening here?" Speaking of that, I mean that makes that brings me all the way back to when I first started seeing you at the Brimstone. Uh, Back when we used to have the Supernatural Nights for the show. I mean, I don't know if you came to the very first ones, those little parties we would do. But then once you came, dude, do you realize how fast of a friend you were? Oh, yeah. that's that's I mean, you didn't really know any a lot of us. (laughs) And it was like you just came over and all of a sudden it was like, dude, Tom's like the fastest friend. He's so easy to get along with. That's one of those things we talked about listening to other people. Like I do. I am very perceptive sometimes about like. Oh, you've mentioned comic books. You must be a comic book guy. Now I've got something <laughs> yeah. to talk to you about, or whatever. Or now, you know, oh, you mentioned pop culture or movies or something. Now we're, we have a we have a connection. So now you're a friend of mine. Yeah. So it's uh, there's no middle ground. Like you're my friend, or I don't know you at all. So it's this. There's that's how I, I try to operate. Um, and it, and it works for from the other from the opposite side, I guess, from the other person. But for me, like I say, it's in, in the back of my mind. I still have that doubt. Like, does this person really even know who I am? You know. Well, that's what's good about having a diversity of interests is what I've found. Is if you have a diversity of interests, if there's multi dimensions to you, then you're going to be able to do that. I mean, you're going to be able to pick up and go, oh, I know a little bit about that, and maybe even yeah. know more than a little, and then we can connect. But if you're kind of cl- clammed up in your own little shell and you don't have, you're not out there getting feeding these dimensions sure um then you're not going to connect with anybody i definitely know a little bit about a lot of different things (laughs) well i mean i think about that i mean i'm kind of like you i'm pretty perceptive i watch what people are saying i'm listening to what they're saying and their body language i can usually tell when someone's uncomfortable around me or if they're just uncomfortable in general because i've been uncomfortable oh sure so your radar goes up and 
I remember just when you first when we first started being around each other, how um, you had all those dimensions. I mean, you would go play uh, Guitar Hero with the kids and like totally yeah. wipe the floor with them. But then you'd, you'd jump into the YouTube party and <laughs> you have the all worst. the great. <laughs> That's some of my best memories from Are the last serious? decade of or so of my life. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We still to this day talk about that. I That's mean, because wild. it was a lot of joy in our home with all of you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Around, I mean, it was just so many different personalities, and yet there were all these connect connective tissue of interest. Uh, it was just a lot of fun, man. That's cool. <laughs> you know, I mean, the the whole Christmas party we had that year, where uh, I think Darren had drawn a picture of you as Thor. Yeah, or maybe it was your birthday. It was my something. birthday. It was actually. your birthday. Yeah. yeah, I still have that, and I have a um. So Adam Burley, yeah, Adam, he did yeah. A, a really nice banner of a, it was a Thor comic book cover with my face on the. I remember that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I'll I'll try to send that to you. You can maybe use it for the promo. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> Man, really <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Uh, that piece there, it's in my den. Actually, it's not hanging on the wall because it scares my kids. But it's a, <laughs> it's a pretty good photo. Um, I got some books from that year. It was that was a great birthday right there. Yeah, that and that was fun. not long after meeting all of you guys. No, like, we had. I think pretty, it was maybe within the first year. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And I'm happy. I know it. You've probably heard me mention filming videos, building websites, creating logos, or building brands on this podcast. Well, there's a good reason for that. I'm a brand builder, and my brand is Parker Brand Creative Services. My team and I have built countless brands in the Gulf Coast region, and a lot of our work in the travel and tourism industry is experienced across the country, and honestly, the whole world. We have our specialties, web, logo, package, and whole brand design, as well as video production and photography. But the reality is we function as a full service advertising agency to businesses that don't really mesh well with larger advertising agencies or just don't want to have in-house creative departments. But don't listen to what I say. Just go to our website, parkerbrandup.com, and take a look at what we do. We're a show it, don't say it team. Okay, you should definitely say it too, but you know what I mean. That's parkerbrandup.com. We think sideways, we push forward, and we'll get your brand up. So take this, you've earned it, a melody and chorus. <laughs> I don't even really know. Me and Michelle have talked about it because uh, I've had times like that in my life where you, a group of friends are all together and it becomes a regular thing. And then for whatever reason, it falls apart. Um, sometimes it's my fault or other, oh, you know, just, or that. it just happens. Yeah. Life Busy. changes. But you know, what's strange is what happened for that I can put together about all that was uh, Michelle and I had a baby right okay and so that was like all those late nights just started that Kill couldn't that, yeah. happen and then not too long after that one by one everybody else started having babies yeah it was like jason had a big ba- jason moved away he had a baby and then i know y'all had children In t- 2010 and, yeah yeah so it was like there was just like and it was natural it was almost like it was time it was oh, like sure. almost like the energy of it was like something new that hey this is about to change you know all your lives are about to change this just has to dissolve right absolutely which in a way is so beautiful because now we're sitting here and like i i guess the value of what it well not the value different people think of friendship in a, in different ways oh sure and i recently had a reminder of that i, I had an altercation with someone that I thought was a friend. And I, I guess it was where what I think a friend is, is a lot looser and has a longer span of time. I've got a friend from high school who I don't see every day, but we used to spend all the time. We spent probably 12, 15 years of our lives together. Yeah. It was like a close brother, but life draws you apart. But when I see him, it's I never think we're not friends anymore. Right. You know, and there's people in my life like that. And you're one of those people like I go, oh, Without a doubt, I think Tom's my friend. I don't see you every day, right? But we're sitting at this table, and I feel like I'm sitting at the table with my friend. Sure. To me, that's what I want out of life. I want those types of relationships where I don't have to be on top of each other like electric blanket or something. But when I do see you, you know, know that I care of you, to yeah. care for you, and you catch up. You you say, "What have sure. you been doing in the meantime since the last time I saw you, or whatever?" Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's not like this um, big bridge and this moat. I right. think sometimes I have met people where that is what happens. It's like, well, we haven't talked in so long. What makes you think we're friends? It's like, oh, that's weird. I don't have that kind of thing in me that builds that says, well, we're not talking. Therefore, we're not friends. Right, right. You know, but I don't know. I don't know what makes the difference. Um, and maybe it's just the quality of the time that we did spend together was so uh, it left good impressions. And the quality of the interactions or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they built little uh 
almost like a museum within yourself of that person. Oh, that sure. person's picture's in a frame in the in your heart somewhere. Right, right. You know? Or your percep- perception of that person. In the, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I think of those times very, very, very fondly. I mean, and when I see different, and which is, I do sometimes. I mean, I do run into people who used to come over and I go, oh, there they almost sit and visit. And it's just, it's as if no time has passed at all. Sure. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know that when the last time I think I had actually saw you face to face was out at uh, Carlos Park one day. We were out oh, there. Oh, yeah. And you came up and visited with us for a little while. I was there were... for a, a birthday party for one of my nieces or nephews or one of them. And I uh, saw you guys there. Y'all were maybe doing a Bible study or something, you and Michelle. Yeah, maybe so. I think the kids were playing and we were we had Bibles. That's yeah, what it that's was. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, I came over, just visited for a bit, and that yeah. was before all the podcast talk and all oh, that. Oh yeah, that was, had uh, to have been, it might have even been like a year ago or pretty, something pretty like much, that. Pretty much, yeah, just a quick catch-up session, and then, all right, got to get back to watching the kids. <laughs> but there you go, it was like proof positive, though. I mean, it was just, you you, you came over, you, yeah. didn't, you didn't, I'm glad to know that, because I like... Didn't walk away and say, and go, oh, oh that, that we guy. don't really talk anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You had a yeah. really big beard at that time, like, oh, he's got that big beard. Oh, dude. <laughs> Speaking of beards, I uh, right before I cut, and it's funny... I have these little mental tricks I play on myself. Like when I want to make a change, and it has to do with, again, seeing myself and, mm-hmm. and I have some weird stuff. And I, I, I work on it, but I've learned these little tricks. And one is um, changing my appearance changes my brain. Hmm. So I knew I could feel a shift. I had a pretty long beard. I'd grown it for 12, 13 months. And I had done that on purpose to change my perception of myself not to have a style not as a style statement sure. but just as the person i'm going to see in the mirror every morning will become someone new to some degree over this period of time so That's it was like a i was reading certain books i was feeding myself certain information it was an interesting experiment but i knew i'd hit sort of this place because a lot of things i was starting to uh were breaking you know, like you know what i mean like i'd become stagnant in certain areas and i could feel it i was like oh, okay yeah. i've hit sort of this, I don't want to call it a plateau, I've hit like a, a rut in this experiment. And so I needed something new and I knew it had something to do with connecting with people. And I needed a shift in my activities, hmm. my spiritual life too, honestly. Sure. And I knew that had something to uh, connect with people in a new way. So uh, <laughs> I walked in the bathroom and I shaved my head down to the scalp and I shaved my beard off. What? And after 13 months, I mean, anybody who's had a beard for a you have you've had one for a significant amount of time. Yeah, yeah. If you shaved yourself, it's like six years ago was the last time I was a stranger. <laughs> yeah, it's like you're looking at a stranger, and yeah. I mean, I felt like a stranger to myself, and that helps me to break across like a barrier. Huh. Something so over the the week after I did that, I could I felt like something was just in my head, like a, a switch. It was like a literal switch gets flipped, and that was when I said, oh. I know what I'm going to do. And it was the show. Huh. And so now I'm back on the, the other end of that, you know, trying to, then I, I said, well, the whiskers are coming back now. I made the flip. I'm just going to have to, this, it's a good tool for me. And yeah. it's a strange thing. I told somebody that at a spiritual retreat I went on and he was, had a kind of quizzical look on his face. He goes, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody say that. I said, well, I said, you know, in a lot of ways, I mean, you look at a lot of cultures, tribal cultures, religious orders, usually when you get indoctrinated into something or when there's a shift, there's some kind of a physical change that comes with it. Like you know? get a tattoo or something like that. Yeah. I've seen that. yeah. A piercing, a tattoo, a new mark. Um, if you join a monastery or something, you know, they shave the crown of your head at a certain point to to and show you what stage. I mean, Buddhist monks completely shave their head. Mm-hmm. They give away their clothes. So, so there is a physical change that's taking place to help you shed the identity okay you know it's an ego thing i think sure and i might be totally off but i'm in my own well, in, in strange your case, that's way true. yeah yeah that's... In, in my case i think the only thing i learned when i shaved my beard that long time ago <laughs> is that i had grown a double and a triple chin and then i immediately resolved to grow it back <laughs> you remember my shame do you remember chad langenbaker oh yeah yeah okay chad had grown a beard when he was working here and this is funny that we've just segued into beards, but look, Chad, <laughs> Chad uh, had grown a beard when he worked here, and one day he comes to work. Same thing. He got a haircut, and he completely—I <laughs> mean, slick shaved. Oh wow! And he, and he comes walking around the corner, and I look at him, and he looks at me, and he just gets this look on his face, you know, and he just <laughs> slowly starts shaking his head, no. And I was like, "What's the matter?" He goes, "Dude." 
I look like a thumb. <laughs> He's like, I don't have a chin anymore. <laughs> oh, poor guy. He's like, I'm never doing this again. And grow it never back. doing it again. He's like, I gotta grow my chin back now, like a line or something. That's awesome. <laughs> I laughed at that. Still to this day, I think about that day because that look on his face, it was just like shame or something. <laughs> he just knew. You know? <laughs> he knew it. <laughs> Didn't need anybody to tell him. Oh yeah, man. So I, I, it's a big question. I might just I'm jumping back into um, what you think about things in the community. But as somebody who works in the community mm-hmm. and is a pillar, as I, I say, <laughs> a hmm. pillar in the community, do you think there's something that needs to change in our community that would make things like dramatically better? Like, I mean, it doesn't be one thing, but like something that you go, this would really shift things here. Oh, man, that's a tough one. It is a tough one. I mean, I think about it a lot, and I don't know what answer I have. Um, I mean, I I think I would agree with probably 100% of the people in this area that traffic is something that needs to to change. I I think infrastructure is important, but I do think that a bigger positive change than infrastructure would be just patience and courtesy on the road. Um, Going back to my whole thing about kindness, it costs nothing to be kind to someone yeah. and to be a, a little bit understanding. It might cost you a, a second or two on the road as you're trying to get home after work or something. But I see so much impatience and just um, just callous disregard for traffic laws and other people's you know, things or whatever. I mean, there could be somebody trying to get to the hospital for a relative that's dying and you know other people are trying to get home so they can watch a football game and they're they're at odds there you just don't you don't ever know what the other person is going through and i'm I'm guilty of this more i would even say more than most people because i have anger management issues sometimes especially on the road now i i don't like you know you're not packing an uzi and you know like jump my window down and scream at people but i silently inside of myself will rage if someone's texting at an arrow and they don't go when the light turns green like put your phone away and let's get where we're going here but at the same time you know watching people block an entrance or an exit to a parking lot and just sit there and and look at the person as they're sitting there like you can't come because i'm in your way it's like that just it it really kind of burns me up how sad it, it or how uh how unfriendly people are and it doesn't have to be that way like it it really could be solved with just a little bit more understanding i I mean that's not just necessarily on the road that's just like in general in the grocery Grocery stores (laughs) i mean if you're the kind of person that you know uses your cart to block the whole aisle while you're looking at what kind of flour to buy or something i really really want to push your shopping cart out of the way (laughs) so everyone can pass and uh, unblock this artery you know but uh but anyway, that that whole like you know sort of un- uncompassionate is that a word? That's probably not even. No, a word, hey, we'll but use you know it. What to, I'm saying? Yeah, I do yeah. know what you mean. That that mentality is is it's really sharp in this area right now because I feel like there are so many of us now in this area. It's yeah. really growing quickly, and, and being aware that there's that many of us, you have to change the way you function. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So. Um, Anyway, and not all of us like to drive, you know, 20 miles over the speed limit. Some of us like to drive just over, you know, around five miles an hour over the speed limit. So we'll stay in the right lane. Some of us, some people are not, they don't do that and they should be, you know, driven off the road (laughs) and arrested. (laughs) But uh, but for those of us that do and we're abiding by it, please don't ride right on our tail and flash your lights at us. Like we're already in the right lane. What do you want me to do? You know? Yeah. So no, anyway. I actually think it's funny that you bring that up because we were just talking about it today and I, one of my friends, we were driving in Lake Charles and I, I used to be really guilty, um, the sin of complaining and I would complain with, I think the, uh, the end goal, hoping that I was coming to a solution to what I was complaining about, or that it would create an action in me. But as after I did it enough, I realized, nope, I'm not getting to the other side of this. I'm going into the cave, but I'm not finding my way out. Oh yeah, uh, I'm not rescuing anybody while I'm down there either. And so, one of my complaints was uh, when I was in Lake Charles. I think it was Nelson Road, and you know now we have these yellow separator bars right. that are on the line. Oh yeah, and that when those went up. I complained about it, and he was like, well, I mean, it'll help. I said, it will. I said, but the, when I look at these yellow bars on the road, I don't just see yellow bars on the road. I see a sign that there's something wrong with us. <laughs> right. When when we, we don't have the capacity to wait our turn, right. we don't have the capacity to be courteous, and so the lines on the road have to come up. 
hmm. because we can't be, control ourselves. Like physically barrier. Yeah. You'll wreck your own car if you hit this thing. Yeah. It's going to affect you personally. Yeah, and that's what thing. it takes. It has to affect you and we yeah. because we're so selfish, we become selfish. And so the and I don't know. I mean I was the way I worded it was like now the lines have to come off the ground and stand up <laughs> to, to, block and, your, and to block us because we can't manage ourselves. Like and now instead of red lights, we're gonna need like actual barricades that come up to stop you yeah, from like, going. Because nope. people run red lights constantly. Sure. Well, we, uh, you, uh, you know what? We might actually get there because if yeah. that's really just one step beyond those lines. That's it. You know, and I, and I just, I would get kind of there. That's where my negative thinking I'm trying to, I wrestle with because those places, when I go there, I couldn't get out of that. I would get in that thought and go, well, everything's going to shit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I understand what, what you're saying. <laughs> and I would just stay right there, yeah. you know, and go, uh, you know, and I, I would love to, the, there is now a part of me which was has long been buried, which is finally kind of growing petals. I hope uh, that says, well, maybe well there will come a day when we don't need those anymore. You <laughs> right? Know? Maybe we actually can learn to be courteous again. You, you see that in in things like roundabouts and four way stops. Like I have never had an issue with the Pugo Street Ryan Street intersection with the four way stop. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, no, right I know there. exactly what you're talking um, about. Yeah. If it's a, I think we're conditioned to wait our turn and then go when appropriate. I know people do run that stop sign. I've seen, you know, I've heard of it happening, but I have never personally seen it uh, happening. And I, I think that's like almost going back to kindergarten on manners for some yeah. people. Like you, you legally have to wait your turn in this case. Sure. And so what, like as a cycle goes on and you also see that in roundabouts, um, in those roundabouts, which I complained about in the beginning, cause all oh, people around here aren't going to know how to do those. I, I think they're going pretty well. Most yeah, of the time. I, I agree. Mean, I actually enjoy them now. At first I had the same opinion. I was like, ah, it's not going to work in Lake Charles or sulfur. Yeah. But yeah, it was kind of funny. It, it's interesting what you end up talking about, but kindness, those basics, what you just said, kindergarten basics, those things mattered a lot to me when I was a kid, what I learned in those early classes, you know, and I mean, that was really the big takeaway. Yeah, I learned my ABCs and how to color, you know, and all that stuff, but just basic um, functioning with the other, you know, yeah. wait oh, your yeah. turn, stand you know, Yeah, if you have to wait in line, kind of behave, you'll be courteous, all of that kind of stuff. But even at those ages, even then, I, you know, there was kids that didn't get it so you know it's just different is in people some people get it some people don't you know and this is i don't know how long ago i had this comment this was years but i had a big discussion with a friend of mine about the difference between mr rogers and sesame street and i love both of those oh, i'd love to hear this but i have friends that grew up watching one and not the other and friends that grew up watching okay you know the, uh, the opposite <laughs> um yeah and uh I, I have found that the people that were mr rogers kids as as kids they were poisoned to be kinder and more courteous and the kids that were sesame street kids just i mean i'm talking exclusively some people watch both and that's awesome sure but the ones that were just sesame street kids they read earlier they knew their numbers they did math really well it's like they got the the books down and then and i'm not saying that was a bad thing but they lacked some of the the what do you call it the the human niceties the, yes like yes the, yeah and i mean that's a very basic thing it's it's further compounded in life as you go through teachers that are the same and reinforce that kind of stuff because there are some kids that never watched mr rogers and are awesome human beings today sure um but at the same time you can sometimes ask someone you know hey what did you watch when you were a child and you can sometimes determine it only people from our age group because people that are older now are younger now they watch all kinds of stuff you know sure so, um but yeah and so yeah, the Mr. Rogers kids always are a little bit, I don't know, they have a little bit more of a thing going on there. Um, That's an interesting observation because I, you know, he's been very popular lately in the media. Oh, sure. And there's yeah. so much going on with him. And I, I was, it made me start to really reflect on it. And I was like, man, you know, I, I have lots of memories watching him. I remember where I watch him. It was usually at my grandmother's house. Yeah. But I look forward to it. I love the sound of the trolley, the, the music, the song, the lessons. And I guess I never really sat down to think about how that affects me, affected me, but it did. I mean, yeah, I carry those lessons inside of me. You know, I, it's interesting. I mean, last night, I, I've had this thing I've been trying for the last year, and, and somebody had read it somewhere. It's called The Apostolate of Smiling. Hmm. And it was like, if you can't do anything, um, just smile. Just have a kind face hmm. because um, the world is busy, and maybe you're you smiling at someone. It might be the Christ smiling at them. Maybe nobody smiled at them, and they don't feel well, sure. friendly in the world. And I said, you know... I can do that. I, I can do that. If I can't do anything else, at least when I'm in the store specifically. I mean, it's free. Yeah, I can just <laughs> carry a friendly face. 
last night I go to Walgreens. I had to get a few things before I went home. I'd worked late and I was, uh, there was a line, I mean, like a holiday line, you sure. know, I mean, 20, 30 people. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've got like two things. I mean, and then you start to go, is it worth standing in line? But I told somebody I was getting it, you know? Yeah. So I get in the line and I get up to, uh, closer to the register after a while and somebody, they finally come and open a second line. And it was weird because it was like an impulse to, uh, I guess you immediately go, oh, line's open. I'm going to jump over there. And so I, I was I was so happy with the way my heart felt. I just kind of turned to my left to the person behind me. I go, hey, they're opening that line. Huh. And there were still a few people in front of me. And she smiled. Oh, yeah. And then I was like, why is she smiling at me? It was weird. And it just felt strange. It's like she's smiling at me. Like, And then it hit me. I'm like, oh. I'm smiling. Yeah. I forgot that I had been kind of carrying a <laughs> smile on my face. I'd been practicing this all year. Right. And so I'm like, oh, she's smiling back at me. And it was you like, told her something nice. And, and so. she was shocked. Like, really, the look on her face was almost like, oh, what? this is strange. <laughs> What's he need? What's he trying to get from me? <laughs> yeah. And so I don't know. I was driving home, kind of small reflection. And it sounds like I'm patting myself on the back. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just saying that I the my observation of that little interaction was that, okay, one, it's worth it. Yeah. Two, this has become an impulse now, a habit that is a good habit, which took a year to do. But, yay, I'm glad. I want to keep doing this. Sure. And then three was the sad thought that I had was that the alien feeling that I received from the person behind me, it was a shock oh, that yeah. they received a kindness. I, it was just sad. I thought, man, it's sad that we are shocked by these behaviors in our culture. Yeah, that's that. I see that a lot. Yeah. Well, uh I know I've had you here for a while now, but I'm oh, yeah. and but it's time to uh, dig in the fishbowl. Okay. So how this works is I call it fishing for goodies. Okay. And some of those questions are questions that I kind of seeded the fishbowl with, and then um, as the show's been going on, people have been emailing me questions and text messaging me questions to put in there. So it's kind of growing, and some of the guests have put questions in there. And so what we do is I ask you to draw three out, and then don't look at them and hand them to me, and I'm going to ask them to you, and we'll talk about them and see where it goes. Okay. All right. So Can I reject any of these? I mean, if hmm, it's... you know, if you reject them, we'll just cut them out. <laughs> is it, there's is there's it nothing crazy in there. <laughs> See, we got There's it. no candy or anything no in there candy. either. No right. toys There's either. One, two. All right. Yeah, I'm not gonna read them. It's all right. It's kind of small type anyway. I think you, you probably have to have Three. some kind of special binoculars or that's <laughs> not what you, magnifying glass. That's what I say. Binoculars. Boy, it's a great interview. Binoculars. <laughs> uh, okay. Hmm. That's a good one. I'm gonna read them first myself. Hmm. Oh, okay. All right. Let's start with this one. Which moments in life do you hold most dear? Wow. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you a probably, I'll just give you one, but it'll be a good one. Uh, and I'll give you two. Okay, so the, when my children were born, mm. this is going to be a, I mean, obviously you have to go with that one, right? But this one, for real, I, it was a striking moment for me. So I have anxiety issues. Like I've got, I in the past, like, seven or eight years ago um i actually had to take anxiety medication for you know just busy at work and you know there's a baby coming what are you going to do you know and so um i was having panic attacks fairly frequently uh chest pain like i was having a yeah. heart attack but it was you know panic so, attacks yeah i went yeah. to the doctor for it and everything and they prescribed some some medicine for it so all that to say i've also suffered through my life with the uh, the awful curse of like passing out anytime there's blood or needles really? or anything. Yeah. Anything health related like that. that. So, um, yeah. So all my family joked about our first child being born and they, cause I was, I wanted to be in the delivery room. I was like, I'm going to be there because you know, I want to be the, the guy that was there. I don't want to be waiting out in the hall and then here's your baby, you know? Yeah. It's, and I wanted to be there to hold my wife's hand and be through the process. And so they were all joking like, oh, he's going to be on the floor before a second goes by. Well, turns out I, I was in there. It was a very fast, um, what do you call it? Uh, it was a very fast thing. She went to the doctor for a checkup. The doctor noticed she had um, some some condition that was requiring her to deliver that day. It was going to be like, we were due like two weeks later and... Uh, it turned out the doctor was like, no, you're going to the hospital like right now and we're going to deliver this baby C-section. So 
I get a call um, saying, you know, can you meet me at the doctor's office, uh, you know, for the thing. So I go home, I have a sandwich, I pack a bag for her because I was thinking she was going to stay overnight for um, observation or whatever. And then it turns out I get there and they're like, no, we're, we're delivering this baby right now. Like you're staying overnight too. So that was a whole different, <laughs> I had built the crib the day before. Oh, you built it? Or you, yeah. put, you built we, it? We had built it. We put it together. Yeah. Oh, okay. Kit or whatever. Oh, okay. I thought you were like, wow, man. No, no, no. <laughs> no, my dad's a carpenter, but built I am it out totally of a wagon not. wheel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I get there and I think the, the quickness of it all is what I needed. Uh, I remember being in the delivery room and, you know, yes, it was, this is a very personal story for a podcast, but whatever. Um, Bring it on, man. It was, it was, you know, delivery is what it is. It's messy. It's not a pretty thing. And uh, it was a C-section. That was the most terrifying and awful, uh, I think, moment of my whole life was seeing my wife there unresponsive, like with the medicine that puts yeah, her down. Right. And it's just like, this is, you know, this is like the person you've chosen to spend your whole life with. And they're just there in front of you, not moving and and there's there's blood and stuff and it's just sure. it was it was horrifying and then so to get away from that moment i walked over to the table where they had brought uh alice my first child and seeing her laying there you know crying because the babies do that and just yeah i remember being very just humbled in that moment like what this is this is crazy that I'm the only, other than the doctors, I'm the of only everyone. adult awake in this room. And this is now both of these people I have to care for. I, these are my responsibility. These are my little wolf pups or whatever. And so seeing her in that little bed, and this this part's the, the totally cheesy part. On the radio, or the little boom box, I guess, in the corner, that song was on. Um, it's that Hallelujah song. You yeah, know oh, yeah, no, about? Hallelujah. Yeah, that um, one. Yeah, yeah. It's the one with the the younger guy that sings it, and I can't think of his name. But man, that song on the radio, this this infant here who's going to require my care. It was this moment of just pure. Just, I mean, I was in tears. Like, I mean, I think one of the nurses looked at me and she started crying a little bit. It was like, it was really, really the big thing in my life. Like that, and that is totally like my still today. My relationship with my daughter is just that. That just care and love and just you know yeah that when my, when it's my, in a snow globe huh oh it, like that that yeah, moment oh, yeah. in like a that, place I, it will it is burned so deep into my mind like I will never forget that that moment and how I felt in that moment the second story with my son being born it was like kind of it's not the opposite but it was it was the the other side of that so same idea C section you know had to do the whole thing I walk in and you know saw all of that and saw him on the little thing and I almost immediately felt like I was going to pass out so I ran out of the room found a corner to sit the nurses almost tripped over me a few times with some carts with some things and and then it was like I just I just got up and walked over and and did the same thing and it was like he was more I guess just looking at him on the table he looked more like aware I guess and awake and not just more independent and now as children that are four and seven years old he's very stubborn and driven and he is his own kid and I mean at the same time he we 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 love one another with everything we are but at the same time he is very much his own his own guy and Alice is she's her hobbies a lot of times align with mine and I think that's because she's wanting to just be uh, wants to please her dad you know like she wants to be the kid that her dad is proud of and that's uh so it, it's seeing those two being born and then like the the years that followed and we we're growing together i keep hitting this no nah, it's okay as they as they grow together so that that's that's probably the two biggest moments in my life i mean and you know you you want to also say a third with when i got married to my wife but man my wife and i knew each other for a really long time the marriage was just it was just a, a, a solidification of that yeah. of that bond. The whole time period's beautiful. Pretty much. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. That's different than a, a single moment. It's not. It's not a single moment. There are many millions of moments that I've had with her that have garland, just built us know? together. Yeah, yeah. That's a good way to describe yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. anyway, that's that's the answer to that first uh, fishbowl question. Well, I love that answer. Man, I mean, I, I got to share this with you because I remember when my daughter was born. Lily, it was that same thing. There was this um, sting song. I can't think of I think it was called I Was Brought to My Senses, but there was a verse in that song that I always used to think about her in that moment. It was similar, and I'll spare you the details because you, you obviously had it that moment. It's captured for you. Yeah. But I remember just laughing and crying at the same time. And the song, the verse said something to the effect of, um, 
I woke up this morning and it was like a veil had been removed from before my eyes. It was the first time I saw the work of heaven and the line where the where the land met the skies. And it, it, it goes on, but it's like a big soliloquy of like inside every turning leaf is a pattern of an older tree. Oh, wow. You know, that kind of stuff. And I mean, that I remember that song captured that for me. It was such a... I, I don't know. Was, I, like I said, it felt like uh, something just my, the top of my head had been cracked off, you know, right. and something came in. Like you're talking about that song, oh, yeah. Hallelujah. It was like all these little elements and you're... And it's like that song is not even about anything like good. It's just... Uh, a, a, but it was the tone of it, it right? Was, yeah, yeah like absolutely. It, it's soothing. It touches yeah. your heart. That song touches your heart. I oh, mean, totally. Absolutely. For for that, that, that to me is such a beautiful subject and it's in and of itself, the way a combinations of elements can come together and sort of crack you open at the right moment in time, the light being in the right place the sounds and um calling it a garland there's a reason i said that because i I tend to think of life that way as like a string of beads sometimes Mm -hmm. and so one day when i was praying on some prayer beads i had sort of a reflection that i'm touching the big bead because it's a bead you know i know it's a bead but between that bead is like a piece of cord that I never really think about. Yeah. The cord holds all of them together, but I'm more I'm so concerned with the beads. And so the beads are like those moments with your daughter. Okay, sure. It's all solidified. It's been sanded on and shaped and it's become this raw wood has been cut down and made into a moment. And it's just this bead that I can hold in my hand. And that's how all these great moments are, but they're all strung together with be these in-betweens. And so I used to disregard the in-betweens. And now I'm starting to learn that all that insignificant stuff that's in between has to be there. It's like the connective oh, yeah. tissue between those beads. And so we want to throw that junk away, but without that junk, there is no garland. There is no stuff. Yeah, there's nothing you else. So I'm, I'm, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That's a wonderful <laughs> answer. I hope that touches somebody. Honestly, I'm sure it will. Uh, this is a totally different. Uh, maybe oh, no. not. I don't know. This one says, what are you hypocritical about? Oh, wow. Um well, you're like ready to jump into that one, huh? No. <laughs> oh, wow. I got lots of answers for that. <laughs> what am I hypocritical about? I mean, I talk a lot about kindness, but I have my moments where I am abs- – I, I, like I mentioned earlier, I kind of struggle with you know rage and anger management sometimes about certain things. I, I like things done a certain way, like in the my professional life and in my personal life. And and sometimes when I don't get what I want, I'm not the nicest guy you'll ever meet. Like I, I'm, I can be kind of a jerk. I mean, I think we're all that guy, you know? Sure. And, I can um, agree with that. And so – um. It, it, so that's that's kind of one of my hypocritical things. I like to talk about you know being giving and kind and, and all that. I I mention all those things as something that I aspire toward. Like I want to be better, um, but I'm not I'm not always there. I have, definitely have flaws, and I I suffer from all kinds of different. I mean, I've already mentioned like three or four of my giant things: the anxiety, the self, you know. Uh, self condemnation and all these other things insecurity and we all have our little things like that and the anger thing you know and but i i genuinely and that this is what i think makes me feel better about myself is that i want to be better like yeah. i want to be um i want to operate on the same level that a person like mr rogers or like a bob ross or whatever i want to operate on that level and something i mentioned to you on the phone yesterday the thing one of the things it, there was a recent mr rogers documentary that um, I don't know if you saw it. It's the it's called Would You Be My Neighbor. I haven't watched it, but I want to. Yeah, it's fantastic. Like the at the end, it's talking about his. They, they were interviewing his wife, and he was talking about how on his deathbed, his wife was was talking to him a little bit, and he mentioned something about how um, one of his. I think some of his final words were that you know, do you think I did enough? This is a man that is as close to to Christ as you can come, in my opinion. As close to just the embodiment of of a good person in quotation marks that you can that you can get to. And even he questioned whether he had done enough on this world or on this earth or whatever to to qualify for his idea of of heaven or or redemption or whatever. And to know that even he questioned how how good of a human he was, it, it made me feel a lot better about all my times that I had fallen or that I had. Um, hurt someone whether i meant to or not because i know i've said things to my own wife to people i love that sure. were very hurtful and, and should never have been even spoken just i mean not we all have a mouth and some of us are good at controlling it and some of us are not and there are times that i am absolutely not you know and that's so like i said knowing that a person as strong as as him and recognize that he was not good enough on his own you know that that gives me a little bit of strength 
but uh so yeah while i while i try to be a, a good guy and you know i want to be easy to work with and a nice guy or whatever there i know there are people around that say oh no that guy was a total jerk to me like i can't stand that guy yeah i'm sure I hope that. there aren't many of them but uh they yeah. exist i'm sure oh i'm sure i i think i i can really relate to a lot of what you're saying and honestly i think if we're all being honest maybe most people can oh yeah absolutely the seeds of what's wrong with everybody is somewhere inside each of us but the seeds of what's best about us are also there too and it's yes it's learning i think to like let the the impulse be towards the the brighter or the lighter side than that darker side and which i mean that's everybody yeah i don't want anybody to listen to this and think like oh man that guy thinks really highly of himself it's kind of the opposite i just (laughs) i I I don't don't think very highly of myself i think that I have room for improvement, you know, and and I know where my flaws are, and I, I try my best to to uh, overcome that. But there are many, many times that I fail at that, and I just you just have to keep your head down and keep trying. You know, you can't give up uh, on your your aspirations or whatever. Yeah, it's like just start again. I mean, yeah. that's I think there's that the idea that um, and in, in Christian one of the thing Christianity one of the things that has really helped me is. Uh, the stations of the cross. I, I I don't always do them on the regular, but when I do do them, I'm always reminded that even this man that we're we're, we're talking about that we aspire to hopefully imitate to some degree. I like the parts where he falls yeah. because uh, when he falls once, he gets back up. Yeah. When he falls again, he gets back up. And then one time when he falls, somebody has to help him get back up. Right. But he keeps getting up. You know, and I and I remember that sometimes when I'm screwing up because I do I screw up all the time. Well, and then the other part of that is trying to make it right for the people you did hurt because at some point you're going to hurt somebody else if you haven't yes. already many times, and you have to go back to that person and whether they accept your apology or your, you know, they grant you forgiveness or not, like you just have to say I I don't know where I was in that moment and I'm very sorry for that encounter. Well, look, I mean, that's why programs like Al- Alcoholics Anonymous work and I mean, even just some certain religions and faiths, I mean, because it calls for an act of contrition or an act of apology and then making right. Right. I've talked about this on the show, but I do have something that I truly believe in that it's, it's that nothing um, arises on its own. It has to be too drawn from somewhere. And so if, if a pain is created an action or a force of some kind has to rush in to fill that space or it has to come from somewhere Hmm. to make things right. There's just balances and counterbalances. And so I truly believe the energy of something negative, the only way to really counterbalance it is to do the right thing. Maybe when you've done the wrong thing and if Hmm. we don't do it, someone else will have to do it for us. Yeah. You know, that's powerful answer, brother. Um, somebody else, somebody else drew this question. Um, Business and peace, money and love, stuff and happiness. Can these things work in harmony? Have you ever felt like that? Maybe you had both going on at the same time, or maybe one's like there's yeah. a deficit in one while the other one's more active? There, there, that third part, the stuff and happiness, almost sounds like it could be like a Buddhist thing. Like, because there's the, the accumulation of things that now those things own you. So it's like that you can never truly be happy because you're constantly trying to build your hoard or whatever. Um, and then busyness and peace. I think you can be busy and also be at peace with what's going on. Yeah. I mean, I've I've been through moments in my own life where I've been just busy to the extent that I feel like my hair's on fire and I'm running as fast as I can looking for a pond to jump into. And at the same time, if I know my direction, I know where I'm going, then I can I can have I guess a, a, a degree of peace that I'm at least making progress in the right in the right way um the middle one what was that again uh money and money love. and love money and love yeah money's a tough one for me because i mean it takes a lot of busyness to get get money yeah. a lot of times and a lot of times busyness if, if you're not if you haven't worked on it which i will say this let me say it like this i'm, I'm answering your question for you okay <laughs> <laughs> uh my own thought on that is that's something I do struggle with, busyness and peace. Yeah. And there's a Zen cone that I've said for years that I, I hope someday that when I say it, I will actually attain it. And it is before enlightenment, chopping wood, carrying water. After enlightenment, chopping wood, carrying water. Okay. And, you know, I've always read that and I feel like I get it, but I haven't got to, well, first of all, enlightenment. <laughs> but if I ever were to achieve that, it's coming back and chopping wood and carrying water still. 
nothing changes. The world doesn't change. You know, you're still going to have things to do. The busyness is still there. Can I be enlightened and at peace and be busy? I haven't found that balance. And so it draws, and most of that busyness comes from trying to attain money, right? Okay, Through yeah. business. Um, and because money is what we all use out here in the society that we live in. But why am I trying to attain money? Well, it's because I love other people in my life. Sure. You're so providing it's a, for. So that question's complex. I mean, for oh, yeah. me, I, I find it's, I think they, they do can exist together. I just don't know that. I think it takes work. Oh, totally. Yeah. I, and, and I don't, yeah, I don't know if that, if that question is even something that could be, uh, boy, that's, that's a hard one. I don't know if that could be answered until you are at that point and then probably once you're past that point will you even yeah recognize that you've passed that point? yeah because so. if you're recognizing it it's almost like you uh you're taking yourself out of it yeah to yeah. some degree i mean yeah I, I think they can work together i don't know all in every situation if they should i think it would be great if we could work like that if we could find for me i would love to find the balance between find peace in busyness sure not not in, i don't mean that like in seeking to be busy where I, i'm peaceful because i'm busy it's because yeah. some people i think use busyness as an escape i i agree with that totally you know? yeah it's like well i'm not happy if i'm busy but then on further digging you find out well that's just it's more just a way to take you out of another problem or to not look at yourself oh true okay i see that you know, not deal with inner work which is hard work yeah so I don't know. <laughs> I know that's your question, but that's just some thoughts I have on it. I mean, as, as other people have actually pulled that same question, and I, I'm always curious to hear what people have to say about yeah. it. I'm, I'm not, I guess my brain's not wired that way to understand <laughs> that question or to Yeah, well, it's a hard question. It. I think it's hard because it, it Or I haven't just, done the internal seeking to, to, to have that generated. Some people don't have a problem with that. Though. Yeah. Some people, that question, you know, that question is irrelevant because they do have peace and they're busy yeah. and they have no problem money's not an issue and it has nothing to do with love so those things aren't tied together that makes sense yeah you know and the stuff and happiness part i don't know if i would say the things i, I mean you're in my studio i've got a lot of things in yeah, here yeah. and i mean you have i know i see pictures of your studio i've been over there you got stuff too oh yeah <laughs> when i walk in here does this bring me happiness i would say like a form of happiness if it were gone I wouldn't be unhappy. That makes sense. You know, but being in here and when I'm greeted by these things, there's pictures of people I care about. There's religious icons. There's books that I like. There's stuff that, that makes me feel that touch points to my life. I told somebody, I said, it's kind of like um, coming to work sometimes is like being inside my own head. It's like this is kind of what huh. the inside of my head looks like. These are the things I'm interested in. This is where I live. I, I definitely get that. I'm in that same same boat. And a lot of the things that are like in my office, you mentioned, it's it's not the stuff that's important. It's the memories attached to it. Yeah. So I don't really like to have a lot of stuff that's. I mean, I like things like transformers and yeah, you know, right stuff like that. But like the, I have a lot of snack trays that hang on my wall in my office, like the old metal snack trays from the '80s, and uh, those are on the wall because I can remember eating cereal on those on Saturday mornings right. around my family and the people that I love, watching television or watching cartoons on, like I say, on a Saturday morning, right. or whatever. And now, like I've have I have moments with my own kids where they have done that with my snack tray from a child. So. This piece of, of junk on the wall is it's it's a fifteen dollar snack tray. You can get it at any flea market, but at the same time, to me, it's more than that. It's it's not the stuff. It's the it's the happy memories behind the stuff. Yeah, so. right. It's it's one of your beads. That's like the beads on your garland, oh, right? Totally. I mean, so you can look at that and you can get to a visceral place inside that, that's attached to all these things. Oh yeah, or a hunk of plastic like some some He Man action figure or something. Like I have really good memories of watching that after school or yeah, you know, or whatever. And so sitting on the floor at our house at as a kid, um, creating these big adventures where good always wins and you know defeats evil. This piece of plastic is now on my shelf, and in fact, the the there are a couple of them that I have that are actually mine from when I they're they're my little handprints, grubby little handprints on them, and uh, those have a, a little bit more of a uh, I have an affinity toward those because they they're my my buddies. You know, yeah. I grew up with them, and I mean, I understand that. You know, what I was my my mother would probably be interested to hear this what I'm about to talk about, but. Um, 
I have similar interests to you, and, and I think most little boys had an interest. You know, if you had an interest in He Man and Transformers, you know, you're probably interested in Thundercats and oh, everything totally. else. You know, yeah. so. But I had a lot of Transformers when I was a kid, and uh, I guess I was probably. I played with toys very late. I mean, or, or I kept them around. I mean, even as I got into high school, I, I had them. I was like, I, I like this kind of stuff. But whenever I was in junior high, um, I had went to a church retreat and they had give us candles. We'd all had these candlelight service. Well, I was like making, you know, like you go through cycles and you're a kid. And I was like, I'm going to pray every day now. And so <laughs> I would light that candle in my room and my parents didn't know. And I had lit it on my dresser where I had like just all my transformers, oh, you know, man. and it had fallen over. I forgot to blow it out. And I was watching a movie and it fell over and my mom comes running downstairs she's like what is on fire it was in the winter <laughs> and our home was heated by these um kerosene heaters all over the house and so they they would blow heat like straight up well apparently my room had been on fire oh god for a while and all the smoke was like pushed against the ceiling and we were laying on the floor you know yeah, watching you tv and then even look my mom comes running downstairs and all the smoke is like going up in her room <laughs> yeah i look up and our whole house it looks like 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 the show Supernatural, like oh, the yeah. smoke monster just all over, like wiggling Jeez. across the ceiling. We could, it was going in every room, so we don't know where it's coming from. Yeah, I don't even think it was me. Your candle, yeah. And so we were opening doors, and I opened my bedroom door, dude, and the whole wall's on fire. Oh, no. And so all my comic, you know, poor me. My dad had the hard job. He had to replace all that and yeah. do a bunch of remodeling. But um, all my childhood toys just melting melted the whole thing all my comic book posters burned up i mean it was just a mess that's awful and so i don't know you know i just it bothers me another day i guess a couple of months ago maybe i was at walmart and there was a uh there was some transformers there i don't remember what brand or line because there's so many now versions but this particular set kind of looked like the originals Mm -hmm. and megatron he didn't turn to a gun anymore it was a tank but he looks like the old one right right and it was plastic but i was like you know i think i'm just gonna buy these now do i play with them no (laughs) but i came back and one night i was up here waiting on some video to encode and i just sat there and transformed them for a minute yeah I turned them back into robots and I sat them up on my shelf and they just sit there and they're in my office and I like to see them, man. It's just like you said. I mean, they they remind me of burning your bedroom down, burning my bedroom down. Yeah, <laughs> and they should you know, remind the me of memories. the time before the fire. Sure. You know? Like I, I, I remember them being on my dresser, you know, I was like, hey, you know, I know these aren't them, but they do bring those memories back oh sure you know and that's important i think to recall your childhood and find those sweet moments when we live in a time too where there's a lot of reissues right now like there's you know they're bringing old transformers back and they're bringing there's the the nes the the nintendo classic that came out recently sure so it's nice to share that with your your own children and, you know like watching my little kid play the same mario brothers that i played when i was a child and the same reactions that I had, like when he, you know, when he gets killed or when he's in the in the game or whatever, and he's, uh, you know, trying to hit that, overcome that one obstacle, and he finally gets it, like the just the joy of that. Yeah, seeing that through his eyes, it's it's a cool feeling, like all the way. Um, so anyway, we yeah we live in a pretty a pretty awesome time in my opinion. For, yeah, where you can go back and find those touch points. Yeah, I was at yeah. Walmart the other day and I saw these uh, in the electronic section. They have the little miniature freestanding. Yeah, arcades. Yeah, arcades. I was like, wow, man, it's pretty cool. My kid could like if I, if, I, if if that's what he wanted. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you buy that and like if you can you afford know, a two hundred and fifty dollar cabinet. My gosh, I know. They're it was a like two hundred and fifty bucks for just like centipede or something right you know, or whatever it was <laughs> one game I, but it was just neat to know that you can do that sure i mean even with this show like when we were talking about doing the branding for it i was like i just I, and i know it was kind of trendy right now to like revisit the 80s but i was like you know i don't know for me that does bring back a little bit of innocence you know mm-hmm. cassette tapes and you know old headphones and just a little slower pace we were kids at the time we didn't really think about all the world's problems and so sure it, yeah, it, it does bring back a, a sense of innocence or whatever. So Yeah, for me, like the 80s, I, I, I have some memories that really stand out for me. And I, I went and watched the We Are the World video the other day. Hmm. And I remember being at school when that was produced. I was thinking I was in the fourth or fifth grade. And um, our teacher had wheeled the TV in so we could watch it. And I was thinking about that the other day. I said, you know, and I, and I know the world probably was shit, too, back then, <laughs> just like now. Can, you course, know, yeah. you can look for it and find it. But as a child, seeing people 
pop stars, which again, just a child reminding everyone out there, <laughs> this is just a child's memory. But I, I thought about it and I was like, you know, we had a symbol of people coming together to do something together for someone else adults um, too. in cool. adults. Yeah, cooperating. So it was good. I mean, yeah, those adults did other things. Sure. But in that moment, it showed solidarity towards hmm. the other. You know, and I, I have a lot of memories like that where I could feel in that moment, similar to when our children were born, where it's like, this is important. I don't yeah. know why, but as a kid. Somehow you can just sense it. Yeah, feel it. This is a value. And so it imprints upon you. Um, and I guess what I don't want to be is the kind of adult that said, well, that was a value when I was a kid, but now I'm a grown up, so I got to go live in the real world. I'm like, well, that real world is the world we've made. Right. You know, and if I don't, what was the point if it doesn't imprint on a child to, you know, be, do something better or just show that people can do things together? Absolutely. You know, well, man, I got to tell you. This has been pretty fun. Me too. I have enjoyed this. Yeah. You don't seem nervous anymore. No, it, it melted away after a little yeah. bit. And I realized it wasn't a, <laughs> yeah. a, a hard thing to do to just talk. <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, I think most of the time anything feels like it's, uh, well, you and I had talked privately about it being like like an interview or almost like an advertisement. And I said, right. you know, when we did this, I was like, that's the one thing. I'm in advertising. I do enough of that. Yeah. And on one hand, being in that industry, uh it's i've never been a fan of the shortness of it i'm like mm -hmm. you know there's so much of it's on the surface and i don't know if we live in the world anymore where the surface is just enough i think we need to know more and, we, and knowing the people behind things and who why they do it and the passion behind it and you know i guess in a way that's what this is just i don't want it to be <laughs> advertisements you know oh, sure no yeah. yeah this is better it's more pure this way i feel like yeah yeah you can get your heart out there i love you just 